Well, let's get the lid. Good morning, everyone. Um, just going to open up our meeting uh, today uh, for the special committee on COVID. Um, we are a bipartisan committee that is tasked with investigating and evaluating the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee will function in a science-based fact-finding review, specifically acquiring comprehensive, accurate data and all information related pertaining thereto. Areas of particular focus will include the administration of federal guidance, acceptance of federal funds, and implementation of emergency use authorization vaccination efforts. A report will be issued outlining the committee's findings and the impact on New Hampshire. Um, I would ask that uh, Representative Polozov uh, lead us in the pledge, please. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I would like to thank everyone for being here. I know the weather was not ideal, but I don't know if we've had ideal weather for the last few weeks. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, Director Buxton, who was originally supposed to be here this morning, uh, has uh, sent an email uh, around 2.15 uh, yesterday afternoon saying that he had a schedule change and could not attend this morning. Um, we do have somebody coming in to talk to us, uh, but they've also got delayed due to weather uh, as well as uh, some other detours. Um, but I guess I would take this time and ask the committee members if there's anything specific um, that we would like to address to Director Buxton. Uh, and we could send him an email so that when he does come in, he has information in front of us. And I will defer to the committee. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think what we would like, or what I would like to see done is to outline, um, perhaps in the same manner that we've previously proceeded in a sort of timeline sort of manner, the uh, specific actions um, taken uh, by DHHS, so actions taken, um, especially significant actions taken, the guidance, even, even if it wasn't mandates, but guidance put out, um, as well as uh, significant actions received, or I suppose you could say orders received from any any federal authorities or or anyone else for that matter, as well as guidance received from any federal authorities or anyone else for that matter. Um, uh, that would be my recommendation, and I think maybe we narrow those down to what kind of things because we we could we could be swamped with data. So what kind of things do we consider significant that we would like to see? as a part of that. Anyone else? Representative Grota. Thank you, Madam Chair. So at the beginning of this meeting, at the very, very the first um, meetings of this commi commi committee, we specifically wanted to see and hear from the Director of Homeland Security based on what we had heard, so I think we should go back to, the, do we have minutes of that meeting and go back? Because all that was outlined. We talked about that in, I think it was the first or second meeting. It was the meeting when when Director uh, Till, Tilly came. Right, and Director uh, uh, Tilly, uh, she had given us um, the guidance and she had outlined given us an outline of the COVID response from DHHS. Um, yes, so we, we do have that outline. Um, and when I did correspond with Director Buxton, I told him that we we're also interested in if he could when he meets with us, give us kind of an idea of what their report is going to contain. Um, 
because I think that is also important um, that we understand what their focus was um, because as we, even in our mission, there are so many areas of focus that we could go down that the hopes to have him in was to not um, try and du be duplicative. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, yes, Representative Evil. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, list in front of me, but I rem it seems like we got something at some point. Maybe I thought it was from um, uh, Director Tilly that said the different subjects that the Homeland Security report was going to cover. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, my thought would be that we look at that list. I remember uh, health was one of them, but we could look at the list and then maybe zero in on those particular aspects of it when he he comes in but i agree with you one of the big things i'd like to hear from him is just maybe an overarching um uh summary of what they're doing and what their timeline is for uh producing their report and then at some point level we can kind of figure out what we're doing that might be additive or duplicative to their uh, work. Right. And and I will forward another email and I will ask for it to be printed out. Um, but I also have here and I was hoping I with everything else going on, I apologize for this, but I'll get this printed, sent this off upstairs. But this is a COVID-19 vaccine rollout um, and how that f followed. Um, and it talks about the the actual rollout um, when uh, on March 3rd in 2020 there was uh, a declaration of public health incident. March 13th, the governor declared the state of emergency. Uh, March 23rd, the first COVID death happened, um, and the hundredth COVID-19 case was reported in New Hampshire. Um, I will send this off to H. Uh, House Committee Services now and ask that they uh, see if they can print these out for us. But it talk, but this is all about the actual vaccine rollout. Um, it, up until, and it goes through, even through to October 2023, the FDA authorizes the emergency use of the updated Novavax COVID-19 vaccine and amends the EUA to include individuals over the age of 12. Um, and when I read that and I listen to Dr. Kuldorf, um, I have some concerns based on some of the testimony that we've received um, about the ages of the vaccines based on what he was given guidance. I don't know how anybody else on this committee feels about that or, or what their thoughts are. Um, so I'm hoping that at some point we can find out the science behind the vaccines and I'll just leave it at that. Does anybody else have anything else uh, uh, that they would like to talk, discuss? Um, so I was going to, so who prepared that? Uh, Your Patricia, nope, uh, uh, Patricia Tilly, oh, Commissioner Tilly, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, because she, DHHS or Ben Chan, be, we, who we've talked about having come in here, um, yeah. seems like they would be the uh, appropriate people to have that kind of a conversation. Um, I mean, as I look at our mission, I think the particular focus is health, but the other thing is the money flows. And for that reason, that's why I think it would be really useful to have Taylor Caswell come in or whoever he might like mm -hmm. to designate to just talk about the federal funds. I think that's something really, really worthwhile investigating because it's something largely the legislature wasn't a participant in. Um, so that that's... Uh, one thing, and I, I don't know how much of that aspect the Homeland Security Director is focusing on. And Representative Ebel, I 100% agree with you. And I, I 
uh, like I said, it would be, I think we would gain a lot of insight um, from uh, Director Caswell or Commissioner Caswell um, coming in here and understanding um, how all the monies flowed. Um, not only, you know, how it was handled at the... Uh, the agencies, but how the agencies actually divested some of that, uh, those dollars, and do they still have those dollars, and are they still utilizing them, and if they do, what are they using them for, and is it is it in the best interest um, of the public, uh, the way that they're using them? I mean, I was concerned to find out that uh, schools were opting to fix things versus air filtration. I mean, because to me, a good air filtration in a school not only would benefit, you know, during the COVID time, but during any time where we have increases, like with the flu and everything else, would help mitigate and keep students healthy. Um, so that, I think, is, is a huge area of concern of mine. So, yes. So I'm just thinking in terms of questions. Yeah. I don't know who to ask the question of, but the but the uh, federal funding rollout, yeah. a timeline would be really interesting. I mean, we've got the COVID rollout and the different you know orders that were issued, but be mm -hmm. interesting to get a timeline of the federal fund distribution and mm -hmm. maybe overlay that <laughs> with the with the health rollout and uh we could ask the homeland security uh director i forget his name but maybe taylor could help us with that too i mean i think that's a worthwhile thing to look at uh because i'm not sure who has honestly yeah. I, I i don't know right uh representative uh, Lekas. <clears throat> and along those lines, what money came in for the schools specifically for COVID response and what did they do with it? What did it actually get spent on and how much is still hanging around? Okay. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just listening to what we've been talking about, I, I wholly agree with that and all of that, um, all of those lines of questioning. I also want to uh, look at... Um, well, for instance, when it comes to the uh, treatments such as a vaccine, I think those are questions we want to put to DHS. And if they had no hand in it, that's not their purview, that would be excellent information to have because that means we no longer have to pursue that line of questioning with them. We can direct it elsewhere. I also would like to look at lines of questioning around things like um, what is variously described as either shutdowns or stay-at-home orders. Um, essential personnel decisions, business and house of worship closures, guidance, the science behind it, the legal authority behind it, what analysis, legal analysis was done and who was that legal analysis done by? Was the guidance coming from the federal level, uh, supranational level? Was it coming from the state level? Who in particular was it coming from? That might give us guidance for who we might ask to come in or present further questions uh, to on these specific topics. Federal funding, um, obviously, uh, tracing that money, the timeline, whether there were and what uh, any requirements attached to that funding and what they were, for instance, uh, did any of these federal funds require the state to have certain, uh, to make vaccines or monoclonal antibodies available? And in how did were there any requirements on that uh, for specific rollouts uh, or or lockdowns or closures or anything else required coming with that federal funding? So these are all questions that I think we can we can reasonably put together and put forward. And again, if the if the answer from DHS is that's not our purview, we didn't have a hand in it. Awesome. Now we can move on and 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 direct them elsewhere. Representative Lucas. Yes, I was looking back at my notes. And um, one of the things I'm <clears throat> interested in is where and how they got their data to make the decisions they made, because we kept getting information um, and we kept, you walk into any place with the TV on and there'd be scroll, you know, waiting for the doctor's office, whatever, scrolling announcements. And I'm wondering where they got 
the data and how they made the decisions as to what to put out. Um, I have a quote from them. We knew our data was bad, but they kept putting out information even though they knew the data was bad. So the question is, where were they getting their data and how were they making those decisions to put those announcements out when they knew their data was bad? Representative Polzov. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, I don't have a specific question, but uh, uh, I wonder like uh, in regular times, our medicine is run by medical professionals with some uh, input from scientists and some input with uh, local policy makers. And then we switch to times when a lot of it is run by military and agencies like Homeland Security. So I wonder what kind of lessons we learned from that. Uh, is, uh, is military and Homeland Security the best equipped to run our uh, medicine or part of it? And uh, is there any better interaction between scientists, for example, and uh, those implementing uh, uh, in agencies, those medical decisions could be made in future in case if we need to involve them again. And in my view, uh, we, we all often hear about uh, science has changed. So our knowledge evolves uh, and in order to implement the best decision, we need discussion, we need some uh, some variety of opinions, but when we have some kind of militarized response with a simple task to be achieved, uh, the tendency is to do the opposite, is to shut down all the discussions and just to follow the, the goal that was initially set. And, uh, that might be one of the line of questioning we want to ask how we should do it differently next time. Uh, and I, I, I like your, where you're going there, but I think we have to have uh, Director of Homeland Security in here to really understand some part of that question. Thank you. Representative Evil. I mean, I think part of the challenge here is that Homeland Security is actually assessing everything that we're talking about and their report isn't going to be done until the end of June. So we'll just, you know, who knows what they'll be able to say when they're here. I just would uh, encourage us that when we're putting together questions that we keep it to a very limited number. Otherwise, it becomes, I think, really overwhelming for the agency. I mean, we can't send, and I'm not saying anybody was suggesting that we are, but we can't send them pages and pages and pages of questions. Because at that le rate, we're going to get less, I think, you know, less is less. It, so we need to be careful of, of the magnitude of what we're asking and, and, and be pretty focused. Okay. Um, I believe we have someone from the public here uh, that would like to speak to us. Uh, Are you, you yeah, uh, please have a seat, uh, introduce yourself and sure. absolutely.
please introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, and what you'd like to discuss with our committee. It's red now. Red means go. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's a New Hampshire thing? Sorry, just kidding. All right, my name is John Bodwin. I live in Massachusetts. I grew up in Connecticut, and I plan to move to New Hampshire. I started a company in New Hampshire recently. Uh, these were printed in Lowell, Massachusetts, but they're distributed by Pathway Book Service in New Hampshire. Uh, it's one of, one of your companies, a very good company. I would highly recommend them. Um, I'm one of very few people in the world that has uh, more than a million non-redacted um, death records that have been analyzed. I've been looking at them for almost two years now, actually over two years. It's, uh, it's April, so over two years. And from that, I was able to glean certain things that no one really can from the CDC data, which isn't really the CDC's data. It's a compilation of all states that send their data to the CDC. <clears throat> In fact, the only way to track uh, causes of death, well, before I get into it, I'm an engineer. I have an MBA. I um, Electrical engineering, my career was in sales of large contracts. So to get an idea about what I did in my career, I would meet with, um, well, it started out engineers when I was young. And by the time I, I don't want to say retired, but I, I was done with that uh, career, I was meeting with uh, CEOs, CFOs, CTOs of multi-billion dollar corporations. Um, I'll just go to the one of the big deals I put together which was the guidance control system for the Trident nuclear missile, MK6LE, which is the Polaris nuclear missile that pops out of submarines. Uh, the guidance control system looks like a basketball. It sits in a nose cone. And um, the companies, let's see, Raytheon, Northrop, no, Northrop wasn't in that one. The prime contractor was Draper, with whom I negotiated the contract and uh, put all the pieces together. But they talked to Raytheon in El Segundo, California, not locally. Uh, also, General Dynamics in Pittsfield, <clears throat> Crane Naval Base in Indiana, Honeywell in Florida, and in, I think their fab was in the, it was in the Midwest, maybe Minnesota. So in, in putting all these deals together for multiple sites, multiple engineers, um, executives, and very big corporations, I'll cut to the chase and say that's, that's netted over a billion dollars in revenue for the company I represented. I was told not to work on it, but I did it anyway. <laughs> and I think they're pretty happy about that. So um, in putting all these deals together, they put $40,000 of training into me, which was kind of like an MBA over, over years. And it's, it's how to speak to people, do public speaking, as well as how to negotiate, but also how to, I don't want to say manipulate, but um, how to get people to uh, understand what you're trying to sell. And it's nothing to do with what I'm trying to sell and what I'm trying to say. It's really what you want to hear and what's important to you. And so it's to bring the value of the information to the person who's listening, which is what I'm here to do today. Uh, so that was my career. And because of that, I speak well, I interface with people well, and um, I can also investigate. I also have my engineering skills. I understand the physical world. Um, I understand, well, science, <laughs> that people don't understand what science is. It's a very long process. Uh, engineering is, is not, you, you work on a schedule, product has to work, it has to be safe, and it has to make money. If it doesn't make money, you don't get a job as an engineer, right? The company goes out of business. Science, they get grants. They have to beg the government for grants. Um, they hope that their baby, their thesis, their hypothesis um, has enough evidence behind it after maybe 10, 20 years. Um, and they, they don't really, uh, they should not be relied upon is what I'm saying. So I have a lot to say, and I'm going to get into the data. Uh, I call it data, but these are really people. Every data point is a person. Every pixel on every graph are people who died. And these are excess people who died who should not have died, and they did not die from COVID. They died from government interventions. So I'll say right now, I'm, I'm here as a journalist. Um, I write under the name Colcanichian, which means, or in Quebecois, coquin de chien, a um, little different accent up there. It means um, bad dog. I like El Gato Malo from uh, Twitter. 
and that's Spanish for the bad cat. So I'm French and I'm the bad dog. And as a journalist, um, there are certain whistleblowers who have come to me with government data. I'm gonna re review that first before I get into the data I have officially and publicly. So the following information regarding the deaths of New Hampshire citizens um, should not have been hidden from the people. The people need to know in order to make an informed decision whether or not they should take a countermeasure, as they call it, or they've renamed it a vaccine, which isn't really what it was, but they changed the definition of vaccine, I'm sure you guys know that, in order to call this a vaccine. Uh, the data belongs to the people, not the government. Identification need not be known for the people to know the results. What that means is um, you, your HHS department should be providing this information. It doesn't have to be identities. They always hide behind the, oh, uh, we can't identify them because of privacy law. Well, the privacy laws are different in death than they are in life, and HIPAA does not apply. But uh, there's no reason why they can't give you the data as to how many people died the day of, the day after, two days after vaccination. So at least 87 people died in New Hampshire within three days of COVID immunization. At least 50 died within two days of COVID immunization in New Hampshire. At least 24 died the day of or the day after. The following 11 people, and I'll only use their first names out of respect because I did testify at another hearing, and I was told um, not to use the last name, so I'll honor that. So the following 11 people died on the same day of COVID immunization. Rodney was 62 years old, died March 29, 2022. Barbara, 68 years old, died January 5, 2021. Amy, 72, October 28, 2021. Daniel, 76, May 28, 2021. That, that's four in 2021. We should have known then. That was four years ago, excuse me, three years ago. Three years ago, there was enough data to shut this down. VAERS, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. I looked at that in February of 2021. There was enough information in four weeks of January to shut the vaccine down, but it was all hidden and suppressed. Um, Anne was 77, May 18, 2022. Louise Fontaine, 81, June 22, 2021. Marguerite was 83 years old, died January 29, 2021. Roger died May 30, 2021. Catherine, 84 years old, died January 9, 2021. Sheila died January 31, 2021. Edward, January 18, 2021, he was 93. These 11 died on the same day of COVID immunization in New Hampshire. These are your people. Since this is a, a broad-based COVID uh, response efficacy hearing, I, I wanna go back to the mask mandate and alert you to certain facts you probably don't know. Very few people know unless you read um, my articles. I'm gonna submit this, I don't have multiple copies. I'm just gonna read a little bit from it. I won't spend too much time on masks. People don't wanna hear about it, but it's gonna happen again if you don't understand what really happened. So. Um, I sued Governor Charlie Baker and the Public Health Commissioner in Massachusetts in the U.S. District Court, District of Massachusetts, um, case 1 colon 20 dash CV dash 11187 dash NMG. That was over order 31 in Massachusetts. That's the COVID uh, emergency orders. Uh, I sued on the basis of I'm deaf in one ear and he violated my constitutional rights because I could not receive free speech from others because I could not hear them without seeing their lips move. So by ordering other people to cover their mouths, he deprived me of receiving free speech. That was the legal theory I used. They rescinded, the governor rescinded order 31 and issued order 55. And in order 55 in paragraph 2B, there is an exception. The exception is people hearing impaired, and people speaking to anybody hearing impaired don't have to wear a mask. And by doing so, he took my standing. I'll get into standing later. It's probably something that the House members should, should consider in changing the rules of civil procedure of New Hampshire so that cases don't get kicked out of court and people's uh, most foundational 
uh, rights are not violated, that is to the right to petition the government for redress grievances. But sticking to the mask issue for a moment and how it relates to New Hampshire, <coughs> let, me, let me go on in that. Um, so the case was dismissed because I didn't have standing. But my public records request came in the day the case was dismissed, and I got 1,200 pages. And if you remember the news in 2020, how Massachusetts, oh, what a major coup. They got um, 1.4 or 1.7 million masks from China flown in on the New England Patriots jet. Everybody remember that? Okay. Well, they, they contracted with Professor Gregory Rutledge at MIT to test those masks. I have the internal emails from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. He tested the masks, and on April 20th, 2020, he reported back to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, they don't work. They knew then they don't work. They're supposed to be 95% efficacy. They were at 38, 42. They got up to 80 in one batch, but most of them were around 50%, which makes them basically useless, and that's across a test fixture, not a person's mouth, with zero leaks. If you have a perfect fit, there are also instructions in this article this is all internal emails from the Department of Public Health. He knew on April 20th, 2020, before he issued the mask mandate, like every governor in every state issued some mask mandate of some type, except I believe South Dakota. Um, and I think it depends on the state. Some states go by county, they have county rules. Um, but you had a broad sweeping, everybody doing masks and Fauci saying, you, you heard him say, ah, they don't really do anything until somebody got to him and said, no, no, no. We need to coerce people into getting the vaccine, so make them wear masks until they get the vaccine. So there is a, an attorney in, in New Hampshire who took on the governor of New Hampshire for parents who didn't want their kids masked in schools. Well, the, the bar of New Hampshire went back in his past, found something, and uh, basically attacked him. And they suspended his license to practice for two years. On the way out of the meeting, I said, hey, what did they say to you? Now, of course, this is hearsay, but this isn't the court. Well, they just asked me how the case was going against the governor. I'm like, yeah, you were sent the message. If you go against the government for anything like a mask on a child where they're fidgeting with it, it does nothing. In fact, it does the opposite because Cassidy Baraka was seven years old and she died with fungal and bacterial pleurisy. She didn't die from that. She died from the vaccine. She reacted in five minutes, threw up for eight to 10 hours, and they gave her another one a couple of weeks later. And she died. Terrible stomach pain. Agonizing. She was dead in five days. But she died with fungal and bacterial pleurisy. Why? If, if you understand material properties and you understand fluid dynamics, then breathing into something on your face is like wearing a Petri dish for six to eight hours all day. It makes no sense at all. It's a warm, moist environment. Now, viruses can't replicate without a host, but bacteria and fungi do, and they did. You, you not only breathe them in, you replicate them, multiply them in the mask, and then when you breathe in, they go deeper into your lungs because they're smaller particles and they deposit deeper. So with regard to um, COVID measures, you should look into why the mask mandate occurred and why did education departments then require students to wear masks and in the same, uh, what they call an order, which isn't an order because they generally don't have the authority to do that. Give you an example in Massachusetts. Um, they said if the class gets, if the school gets to 80% vaccination rate, then you don't have to wear a mask. What does that have to do with the trying to protect people? It's clearly a carrot and stick. These rules that came out and, and check the rules in New Hampshire. I, I, I'm friends with one of the uh, litigants, one of the plaintiffs in the case, um, and she, she lived in Brook, the Brookline um, Hollis School District. And has since left the state, like many people, because they don't want their kids being abused by mandates that do nothing except coerce people to get a vaccine that's dangerous. <clears throat> there was other coercion, coercion of doctors you need to look into. <clears throat> Excuse me. The American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Family Medicine, American Board of Pediatrics put out a joint statement to all doctors in the country. 
And this was based on the Federation of State Medical Boards. Now, that, that sounds like an official organization, right? The Federation of State Medical Boards. It's a nonprofit, non-governmental organization with a ton of power. They think they regulate everything, licensing and everything else. Go look at who their executives are. It's on the, um, it's on the web. Look at the board of directors. They're more concerned about DEI than they are concerned about making sure doctors are qualified to practice medicine. And when you have a centralization of authority like that, they rain tyranny down on the people. And what you have is losses at the margins. I, I'll, I'll try not to talk too economic focused. Um, I'm, I'm told I speak above uh, certain people when I do that. But, so the Federation of State Medical Boards. Well, here, here's the, uh, I'll, I'll submit this as well. This was September 9, 2021, the Federation of State Medical Boards, which supports its member states, member state medical licensing boards, has recently issued a statement. It sounds like they're in charge of supporting your medical licensing board, but they shouldn't be. They're just another organization. They're a RICO organization. So saying that providing misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine contradicts physicians' ethical and professional responsibilities. They're telling physicians they, they can't say anything that they consider misinformation and therefore may be subject to physician disciplinary actions, including suspension or revocation of their medical license. They're threatening publicly, still on the web today, every single doctor in this country, that if they don't comply, if they don't shut up, and they don't give them the guidelines as to what's information, misinformation or information or disinformation, they're now in charge of your state licensing board? If I were a resident of New Hampshire, I'd be pretty upset some group down in Texas that's getting a ton of money from various organizations is telling your medical board what to do. Uh, we are the American Board of Family Medicine, American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Pediatrics, and we support the FSMB's position. So this, this joint statement is from the CEOs of those three medical boards. Now, if you don't know the difference, so state licensing boards are for licensing your doctors. But the board certifications, those are kind of NGO organizations that certify doctors so that they can, say, operate in a hospital because a hospital, for insurance reasons, won't let um, a doctor, they'll take away privileges to use the hospital, which they need to use, right? So board certification is very important to doctors in order to be able to function in their, in their purview. Um, and they go on, we also want physicians certified by our boards to know that such unethical or unprofessional conduct may prompt their respective board to, be take, to take action that could put their certification at risk. Another threat. This is the society we live in where the doctors you go to are threatened by their boards and are making decisions for their own best interest and not yours. I'll submit that as well. The FSMB uh, spreading COVID vaccine information. So this is directly from the FSMB that's referred to by the CEOs of those boards. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, RICO crime, uh, the, the elements of a RICO crime. It has to be an enterprise that's two or more entities in most uh, jurisdictions. Sometimes it's three or more, it depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. This being federal, uh, two or more entities. I just read you three and four, if you include the FSMB. Um, it has to be a pattern. Now, pattern means, again, different things in different jurisdictions, but in most cases, it's at least two times. So they have to have committed that illegal activity at least twice of racketeering activity. And the racketeering activity, are, it's a list of predicate crimes of which fraud, murder, and, and such can be uh, part of it. And I will get into that. So the, these organizations relating to each other and communicating with each other, especially with um, Exhibit H in the CDC memorandum that I handed to you, you don't have to look now, but um, if you look at that, you'll see America First Legal, Stephen Miller uh, is associated with that organization. They did a, they did a FOIA, a federal um, FOIA, not a state one, <clears throat> for hhs.gov and received information and in that information, you will see that 
hhs.gov, CDC, and others uh, from the U.S. government conspired with people from Facebook and Twitter. They have an open portal. They communicate as to what information they want taken down. So whatever citizens post, the government, our government, and the, the centralized government in Washington, D.C., is telling you what you can or cannot say, what they deem misinformation. Even if it's not misinformation, if they don't like it, they want it down. They have people suspended. They have people, they had people embedded in Twitter. You know that. You know that, that you know, if they weren't getting their check directly from FBI, they were still taking orders and their check was coming from Twitter or Facebook. So the FSMB, uh, like I said, they're basically impersonating a federal agency. As a, it, It's a nonprofit federation, not a federal entity. State licensing boards bow down to a woke entity out of Houston, Texas, run by oligarchs. Every board and every group is captured, and they, co they use coercion solicitation to get doctors and hospital administrators to, to do their bidding. If, you've, if you interview certain doctors, you'll learn what I learned directly and why they left Massachusetts or another state that pushes the, uh, the drugs. Um, one was a 40-year-old came in with 95% oxygen. He was told he had to, by the hospital, the administration staff, he had to put them on a ventilator. Why? Well, the doctors were told that if you don't put somebody on a ventilator and you only put them on a CPAP, you don't contain the aerosols to the patient. A CPAP will allow the aerosols to go into the room. And the staff is going to die. The nurses, the doctors, they're going to die. So that's what they did. They took people with no problem with oxygen and they put them on ventilators. Now, why did the administrators of hospitals tell the doctors to do this? Was it because they really believed about the aerosol problem? Or was it because the CARES Act and other legislation at the D.C. level, in, in, and I heard you talking earlier about the money, it incentivizes people putting up, being put on ventilators. There are a few things that are incentivized. One is putting COVID diagnosis on a death record or um, a patient record. They get money for that using ventilators. They get money for that. There's a drug called remdesivir. Um, if you don't mind me asking, um, do you have documentation that shows that they're being incentivized? Just out of curiosity. If, if I might, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but if I might, I, that was actually in the documentation I read into the record at the last meeting. Thank you, Representative. There we go. Um, <clears throat> direct accounting files? No, that's like the holy grail of evidence uh, nobody has. But I, I can go on the web and I can look at cms.gov. Okay, you go to cms.gov and look for NCTAP. That's the COVID payout plan. And you'll find that Illumiant, uh, which is baricitinib, or Veclary, which is remdesivir, has a 20% adder to the entire hospital bill. If, if, if somebody goes in with a... I'll, I'll get to examples in a little bit. You're going to see. When I get to the real evidence, um, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's, it's bad. They, they murdered a lot of people. More than a million people. So the CARES Act I went through um, is it basically a solicitation of fraud. Um, Walter E. Williams said it, but probably also said by Thomas Sowell, Milton Friedman, if you subsidize something, you'll get more of it. And since they subsidized COVID being put on a death certificate, thinking somehow they're convincing the people that that's going to save people. Uh, how is that going to save somebody? But that's what they did. Uh, people being put on ventilators, that's an 86% kill rate. 86% of people die, get put on ventilators. And they did it to people who, whose vital signs were normal, and they died. I'll tell you about 28-year-old Danielle. So 18 U.S.C. 1035 is false statements on healthcare matters. 1040 is fraud and disaster relief. 1343 is fraud by wire. 241 is conspiracy against rights. 242 is deprivation of rights under color of law. Those are just five. There's a lot more. And they carry five to 20 years, sometimes more. And they add up. 
because they did all these things plus murder. Um, they're doing this as a matter of custom and practice in almost every um, medical examiner office. And I say that by extrapolating the data that I have across other states. I know that they've been writing things on death certificates that are not true. I also know that the CDC has been deleting vaccine as a cause of death, which I will show you evidence of that's in the CDC memorandum, paragraphs 49 through 51. So New Hampshire deaths in Massachusetts and Connecticut, if you open the books, there are some loose um, papers in front. <clears throat> I'll try to go through these quickly. Um, this is public. These are obituaries online. So uh, Rick, Rick Morse, he died of a heart attack in his sleep, March 5th, 2024 at age 64. I know that he was vaccinated because the, 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 it correlated to the only record available in, in bears for that person um, with all those details of death. And so he was vaccinated on January 25th. That's 40 days. Um, it should be investigated. If, if this VAERS ID really is him, then he died in 40 days after gene drug injection on March 5th, 2024. People are still getting the vaccine, uh, excuse me, on uh, January 25th, 2024. People are still taking these shots because the government and state governments are telling them to, and they're still dying. So the lack of information is actually if you're a knowing person, and many of the people in these health departments in states are knowing people, if they know and they're not stepping forward, then it's murder. Uh, if you turn the page over, Gary Dayton um, died April 30, 2022. He was 82 years old. This requires investigation. Uh, he actually died in Connecticut. That's why it says Connecticut on the death certificate, but he was a resident of Hanover, New Hampshire and a cerebrovascular accident, that's a stroke. <clears throat> New Hampshire resident Robert Miles II, 39 years old, died four days after immunization. He had a heart transplant in 2017. I knew that these drugs were prothrombotic in February of 2021 by reading the VAERS data, it was obvious. And, and my analyses, even I, there's a video of me in April, from April of 2021. And in that video, I have listed many of the deaths from pulmonary embolism <clears throat> and other, <clears throat> excuse me, and other prothrombotic type of um, causes. So that's a 39 year old. Oh, and then uh, Anna Tucker was 26. She was immunized one day before she died on January 8th. She was immunized on January 7th. Passed away peacefully in her sleep. Stoshu Gronstoff, two days earlier, December 22nd. He was vaccinated earlier than the death date, which is Christmas Eve, 2021, unexpectedly. <clears throat> And if we look at the graphs, these are, I don't have access to the New Hampshire data, which is, which is a problem because nobody in New Hampshire has access to it either. And that's what I was trying to do with HB 1661 was get the people of New Hampshire to get the data. And that doesn't mean divulging people's names. This means knowing what's happening in New Hampshire. What are people dying from? So these, um, if you understand the term ketris paribus, it means all other things being equal or in parity. And through the years, people from New Hampshire utilize Massachusetts hospitals and they travel to Massachusetts and so forth. And so all of the other things being equal, say the number of people who use the hospitals and so forth, um, let's look at that and look at these graphs in that light. And you'll notice in the top left, are the D68 codes. These, these are ICD-10 codes. These are the codes used internationally, put out by the WHO, a subset of which is adopted by the CDC. And so New Hampshire, what you will do is you will create a death record with part one and part two 
Part one is the causes of death, and it'll be A, B, C, D in backward time order, the way it should be, but <laughs> the doctors don't know how to do it right, so they get it backwards a lot of times. And part two is contributing conditions, usually like you know asthma, smoking, alcoholic, um, conditions that may have contributed to the cause of death. So all other things being equal in these clot deaths, you'll notice that in 2015, it was four, and then 2016, it was four, and then three, and then two, and then five, and then six. And then in 2021, when the shots came out, it was 12. It's more than double the average, more than double the trend. No matter how you look at it, it's more than double in a single year. And if you look at anemias, so there's, there's thrombocytopenia, and then there's just regular anemia, um, neutropenia, a lot of, a lot of anemias. Uh, I, I call it anemias. That means you're, you're, you're lacking some type of, uh, of, of blood cell of which you think of three types. Uh, thrombocytes are your platelets, right? So they're for clotting and stuff. And then your white cells for killing off bad stuff in your body and then red cells for basically carrying oxygen mostly. Um, take a look at the graph. You know, it's, it's pretty substantial and stark when you look at 21. What is happening to New Hampshire people dying? A lot more in 21 from a cause that wasn't really high in 2020. 2020 was the year of COVID. Huge first wave in Massachusetts. I think the only reason that huge first wave didn't happen in New Hampshire is because you don't have the financial incentive that we have in Massachusetts. And the world should know about Massachusetts. I'll, I'll, I'm going to take a break and tell you about Massachusetts here for a second. 600 pharma ecosystem companies in Massachusetts alone, $47 billion in venture capital financing. There are 50 companies over $100 million a year in pharma and revenue in Massachusetts, 10 companies over a billion dollars. Moderna's headquarters in R&D is in Massachusetts. Pfizer's divisional headquarters for the mRNA vaccine is in Massachusetts. Rochelle Walensky is from Massachusetts. My congressman is Jake Auchincloss. His father is Hugh Auchincloss. Worked for Fauci for 20 years as his number two. That's all Massachusetts. And if you look at on J July 27, 2020, of all sovereigns in the world, with three million people or more. The top three purported COVID deaths per population were New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, with Belgium a distant fourth. So far distant that Massachusetts was 50% more than Belgium. And I'll offend Belgium here by saying they're probably one of the most corrupt countries over there in Europe. So if, if, if they're that way, what, is Ma what are Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey? And why, why New York and New Jersey? Well, you've got Wall Street. New Jersey's based, northern New Jersey is just a suburb of Wall Street, lower Manhattan. So all the executives live out in the burbs in, uh, in New Jersey. They padded the numbers quite a bit. How do you prove it? Good luck. I can prove it in Massachusetts because I have the records, but New York won't give up the ghost. They won't give up the records. So when I talk about Massachusetts, it's not just that I live there. It's not just that I have the data there because I'm also going to review some Minnesota data. It's that Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey fooled the world. And I'll show you the fraud that they committed. Acute fentanyl intoxication. They tested dead bodies. Oh, positive COVID test. It's a COVID death. Blunt force trauma to the head. Blunt force trauma to the torso. Old ladies falling down the stairs in the care homes because nobody was there to care for them because, oh, COVID. They called these deaths COVID deaths. They padded the numbers. If they're willing to go so far and commit such fraud for accidental deaths, what do you think they did for heart attacks for 95-year-olds? In the CDC memorandum, I'll save myself some time flipping to the page. I also have Vermont records. A 98-year-old, she died from a heart attack. Who's going to say anything about that? But I matched her up with a VAERS record of the only 98-year-old who died on the same day. And she was injected two days before, and what happened? Her heart rate went to 145 beats per minute at 98 years old. She was dead in two days. It wasn't mentioned on her, on her death record, but I found the data. They killed her with the jab, and then they hit it, and they refused to mention it. 
there's absolute evidence that the vaccine killed this woman. Woman. Now, yeah, who's going to mourn? Oh, 98 years old. That's sad, right? She was a person. She didn't deserve to go by having her heart race for two days. From And we know that tachycardia and dysautonomia, and I'll show you some graphs about dysautonomia, has occurred from these jabs. So clots in the brain. I mean, the, the graph says it all. You know, 11, 8, 10, 10, 17, 13, 13, and then 27. Again, it doubles. It twice the number of deaths. And if you, the, the, Jeffrey was from Hudson, New Hampshire. He had a stroke in days, hypercoagulable. So uh, hyperclotting. Oh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, CVST, intraventricular hemorrhage. He was hemorrhaging all over his body in days. Uh, Elaine was 61. She died. She was from Rochester, New Hampshire. 61 years old, died January 5th, 2022. Cerebral herniation in hours, multifocal cerebral infarcts, aortic dissection in days. Aortic dissection and a cerebral herniation. The heart is not that close to the brain. Why is she having a hole eaten through her, the endothelial lining of her aorta at the same time having a massive stroke? Have one or two, which, you know, it needs to be investigated. Because as I sit here, I think about my mom. My mom had a stroke uh, and had, had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. But that was a year apart. Um, th this woman who died having multiple things going on needs to be investigated. Clots in lungs. So these are pulmonary embolisms. It's very difficult to find in the data the... Uh, neurological stroke and, and other issues for intracranial and intraspinal issues because the codes by the CDC, the G codes, are scattered across about 50 codes. But for pulmonary embolism deaths, there's only two. As big as your lungs are, there's only two. As big as your brain is, is 50. To give you an idea of how to trace data in, in this regard, um, so the clots in the lungs, right? So that's pulmonary embolism. <clears throat> Take a look at 2021. You got 9, 12, 11, 14, 16, 16, 27. Lindsay was 27 years old from Newton, New Hampshire, died August 4th, 2021, pulmonary thromboemboli and a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, they probably go together because you get a clot in your leg and your calf, right? And they call it throwing a clot. It goes up to your lung and then you could have ventricular failure and die. Jeffrey was 30. I mean, just listen to these ages. 30 years old. Died November 7, 2021 in Epping, New Hampshire, or he's from Epping, New Hampshire. Cardiogenic shock, massive pulmonary embolism. And I, I told you about... Um, a million people have been killed by uh, drug and hospital protocols. So it's not just about the vaccine. I'll be speaking in Houston, Texas at Halt Hospital Homicides too. It's the second one they're gonna have in, um, on June 1st. It, if you could just sit on some of these calls with people who've lost their husbands, their wives, their children, and to hear what the hospitals did to these people all around the country. And I imagine that New Hampshire is probably no different. Red state, blue state, this is not politics at all. This is centralization of authority that creates marginal losses as they push out. You know, you have a central point of failure when they push out what they want you to take. The doctors just do it. They don't want to lose their license. And, and I've, I'm, you've got the evidence on that. So 150,000 excess sudden kidney failure deaths alone. This is excess. So this is more than normal. And when you flip this over, so I'll say there's a million Americans have been killed by both the vaccines and the hospital protocols. I don't know which one is more. I, I tend to think the hospital protocols killed more people. So let's look at New Hampshire. Um, oops, there it is. All right, let's take a look at New Hampshire residents who died in Massachusetts, top left, where it says cut sudden kidney failure. 
do you see a problem here? 2021, 2022, 2023 is not here. Imagine where that is. Maybe it drops, you know, I don't know. Joseph died. He was uh, 30 years old from Franklin, New Hampshire. Died on December 28, 2022, multi-system organ failure. Pneumonia, flu, Staphylococcus aureus, sudden kidney failure. It, it's not that, you know, everybody says remdesivir takes out your kidneys. It's remdesivir. It's remdesivir. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biologist. I have six medical files of decedents that families have given me. One is 12,000 pages. The other is 6,000. One's 4,000. The hospitals are so nice that when they give these to the families, they're not searchable. They give them images. So I had to run it through a software program and optical character recognition to build the words from the images. And when that took an hour to run, then I could search for remdesivir, baricitinib, and vancomycin. So I, I don't know. Some people say it's baricitinib. Some people say it's remdesivir. I personally think it's vancomycin in combination with one of the other two. I believe vanc vancomycin is a very, very strong um, antibiotic. But here's the protocol it's given, and there's evidence in the CDC memorandum with individual cases. I'll, I'll read probably one of them, so we won't take too much time. And you'll see. <clears throat> and here, here's the protocol, or a, there are variations of it. I'll just talk about Danielle now. I'll, I'll do it from memory, but it, it, it's in the CDC memorandum. 28-year-old woman. Her mother got nervous that she tested positive for COVID at home, and she had a neighbor uh, use the little finger pulse ox. And the neighbor said, oh, it's, it's only 87. You should bring her in right away. So she brought her in. She was 95% oxygen when she got there. 95%. Not a problem, right? Because she had a positive COVID test, they started her on remdesivir and started running that stuff through her veins immediately. 200 milligrams first day, then you go 100, 100, 100, 100. It's a five-day course. So you go 200 and then 100 for four days. That wasn't enough money, though, to get a COVID diagnosis and remdesivir. They had to get, get her on a ventilator. So I, I looked at the time, uh, and again, you know, I'm telling you, these are thousands of pages. And as I go through time, there were hourly... Um, vital signs that were taken on her. And then there was probably, I don't know if it was daily blood check, um, but there were, it was often they were checking her blood. So her liver enzymes were actually fine, um, even through the remdesivir, but her vital signs. It was in the area of um, 60 beats per minute, heart rate. Um, her breathing was about 15 breaths per minute. This, this is all normal, right? 97 point Eight or nine uh, was her temperature, did not have a temperature. She didn't have a breathing problem. She didn't have a pulse ox problem. She didn't have a temperature problem. She didn't have a heart rate problem. When they put her on a ventilator at 95% oxygen and they killed her, she didn't need it. But they got their extra money because if you incentivize something, you'll get more of it. And they got this 28-year-old. Why? She was learning disabled. She couldn't. She couldn't defend herself, and her mother was not allowed to see her at that point. And so she developed a lung infection, which happens when you get put on. Um, May I just interject to ask a question? Absolutely, Representative. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for, for all of this. Um, so when it comes to, and I've heard you talk about the ventilators uh, a few times now, and I think that's a very important thing for us to look at. I've heard, and I don't recall exactly where where I've heard it, um, so I'm wondering if you have any information regarding this, that the uh, protocols for early, extremely aggressive ventilator use um, may have originated with the World Health Organization and been pushed down from there. Is that something that you've heard, have any awareness of, or have any evidence for? <clears throat> I, I don't want to answer something I don't know. Fair enough. But I, I know if you go to the NIH, and, and that's where I believe you should start your investigation, uh, not the CDC necessarily, but the NIH and how to treat this. I think that's where it originated, uh, if, if not the WHO. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, she, uh, she got put on um, the ventilator, developed a lung infection. They couldn't stop it. She went septic. They tried vancomycin, of course, and uh, her kidneys failed. 
And the, the gentleman from New Hampshire I just mentioned with the multi-organ failure, all, I mean, everything goes wrong in the body. They're, they're pumping them so full of the drugs. And here are the drugs, they, they kind of get you ready for going on a ventilator. Midazolam, lorazepam, fentanyl, propofol, dexmedetomidine. All of them. I'm not saying one or the other. They're hitting you with the anti-anxiety. They're hitting you with the, uh, the painkiller. They're hitting you with everything. And they, they basically kill people. I don't mean to interrupt, um, and I know you're not a medical doctor, but I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that if, when you're speaking about the one person where they come in and their oxygen rate really isn't that low, they don't have a fever, they don't have anything, and then they put them, you're saying the protocol is to put them on like five or more drugs, for lack of a better word, that that is the protocol for basically anyone that they're prepping for a ventilator? Yeah. And, and yeah. You can't put somebody on a ventilator unless you get them all calm and, you know, you get... get you, I, I, you're gonna you're gonna have to ask a doctor about this because yeah. the uh, the doctors have a lot to answer for. They're doing what they're told, but th I did what I was told is not a defense for murder. I appreciate that, Representative Belcher. Did you have something? Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to provide a little bit of information because I have a healthcare background. I was a paramedic for quite some time. Um, when it comes to historically ventilating patients. Um, I will say it's not necessarily uncommon to ventilate before hypoxia sets in because once hypoxia sets in uh, through low blood oxygen, um, it can uh, quickly go, very quickly go south from there. So typically what people look at or what they historically would look at is uh, work of breathing. Indicators suggesting muscle fatigue that suggest breathing is failing. Um, in order to uh, to ventilate. Um, I think the big thing we want to look at here, given some of this testimony we've heard, is we want to verify whether there was a deviation from looking at these traditional metrics, such as work of breathing, in, especially in order to do anything akin to um, to control of the uh, of the of the spread of the pathogen, because that would be a very interesting finding if these people are truly overriding traditional metrics for ventilation in order to provide some sort of a containment. Thank you for that, please. What, what he said, I agree with everything. It needs to be investigated. And that's the, the, the point is not whether remdesivir, vancomycin, baricitinib, and other protocols are killing people's kidneys. The point is the criminal omission of conduct to investigate by the CDC, by the FDA, by the NIH. All three directors of those organizations and 13 of their deputy directors received a copy of this certified mail. They were served. Not this bound one, but a loose one with, um, th this one has about five or six names changed in Minnesota because they didn't want their names in it. So I said, okay, fine. And their names are not in, but all the other names in here are correct. So they received this and once they've been notified, they can't unknow. They have a legal duty to act. Okay, you, you and I don't have that duty. Well, you sort of have that duty. You, you're, you're members of the general court. You're officers of the court of New Hampshire. So you do have the legal duty to investigate this, is, and that's, that is what you're doing. But at the CDC, they refuse to investigate what's killed 150,000 excess people by a single cause of death. That's the worst thing since 1918. And it doesn't matter what you believe about the Spanish flu, whether it was the virus or a secondary bacterial infection that killed people. You just got to know that there were a lot of extra people who died. And it bears investigating. And we have the ability to investigate. All the information is in CDC and state databases. They refuse to investigate. If I had access to the information within a week, I can tell you, and I'm not even a doctor because I'll just go through and find the common thread of all the people that died from acute renal failure. How many got remdesivir? How many got vancomycin? How many got both? How many got Illumiant, uh, uh, baricitinib? So the omission of conduct of investigation is the crime. 
they're they're killing people and they, and they don't want to know. In fact, they'll kill your kids and go out for sushi that day and laugh about it. Sorry, I had to throw that in. All right, so you'll notice that the pattern of New Hampshire deaths from sudden kidney failure in the top left, which is a 100% increase, and that's 27, 28 people in 2022 alone, and that's just New Hampshire residents in Massachusetts hospitals or in, Ma or in the state of Massachusetts. Imagine how many hundreds in New Hampshire, hundreds of excess acute renal failure deaths in New Hampshire. They're killing your citizens. Now look at Massachusetts. You'll see 2,000 excess, 2,000 excess people in Massachusetts alone in the top right. In the bottom left, 1,600 excess Minnesota, 1,600 excess Minnesota. This does not include 2023. If I include 2023, I'll say more than 3,000 excess renal failure deaths in Massachusetts alone. So when I say 150,000 across the United States, I mean it. And in the bottom right, I'm not at liberty to say yet, but does the graph look familiar to you? It's the same as all the others. This is an insane amount of excess deaths by acute renal failure. These are not happening at home. These are happening in hospitals. I, I, there's work in progress that I can't really talk about. And um, within a couple months, you guys keep doing your work to investigate, and you'll have a lot more information to rely upon in a couple months from multiple entities, coordinated. Okay. <clears throat> I went through uh, these. <clears throat> so I testified for Bill HB1661. And after I testified for that bill, and I answered all questions, um, there, there, there was only one question that kind of threw me. It was the second time that same person asked. Uh, bill H, HB1661, real quickly, it, it's more than just trying to get the vaccines put on death certificates for anybody who died within two years of the vaccine. That's part one, right? There's four sections. The second section compels quarterly reports from the state of New Hampshire to the people saying how many people died within one day, three days, one week, three weeks, 10 weeks, 25 weeks, and one year of, vaccinate, of, of any type of immunization. But the, the, the third and fourth are the most important. The third compels the state to do an investigation, much like I've done, and I'm one man. I'm just one guy. With, and, and if you've, you've seen my work, some of it, there's only a piece of it, then you'll know that it's the most comprehensive uh, public health analysis ever, anywhere. I can tell you every cause of death. Um, I can't tell you definitively what happened because many of the causes of death rely upon the custom and practice of the local medical examiner's office. So you'll find different patterns in Minnesota than you will in Massachusetts because they were taught how to fill out death certificates differently and write different words. And when those words go to the CDC, they get run through Transax and Acme software. And the words are that I, I started to tell you before, part one and part two, right? So New Hampshire fills out the words. They go to the CDC. Again, a single point of failure. They get run through the software. And that applies codes. And that is the only way we as citizens know what's happening is to track the codes. Because you can't read all the different words that all the crazy doctors write on death certificates. The medical examiners are pretty consistent because they do about 400 per year of... Uh, death records. Um, but a regular doctor, you know, it depends if there's a doctor in a care home, he might do, you know, 20 or 30 a year. Um, but a regular doctor, a family practitioner, probably only does one or two every couple of years, right? How many people die in the office uh, of, a, of a doctor? So when they do one, they don't do a good job. But um, the software is supposed to pick out the words and then apply the codes. If they're using different words, and I'll give you an example in Minnesota, then Massachusetts, then New Hampshire, right? So here's Minnesota C41, bone and articular cartilage cancer is way up. In Massachusetts, bone and bone marrow cancer is way up. Well, that's C41 and that's C79. They're completely different. But if, if, they, if it manifests the same in the human body and it's the same disease for bone, maybe bone marrow, 
but they just write a different word, sarcoma or whatever, it gets picked up differently by the Transax and Acme software encoded differently. So now we think we're getting good information. So the integrity of the data relies upon custom and practice of human behavior in every office. And therefore you should not look at the entire United States. You should look regionally to see what has happened uh, because of, like I explained earlier, Ketris Paribus. All right. I, I wanna read <clears throat> the uh, response I sent to the house members after my testimony and after the um, HHS, uh, DHHS people testified. Um, please stop and ask questions anytime. Um, all right, I'll try to go through this quickly. So after testi testifying, I fielded questions from House members. Um, I, I didn't know, somebody told me the parties were on different sides. I, I don't know how you guys sit. I didn't know who I was talking to, but I can say that it seemed very fair. There were questions from both sides. And um, I found out later that, you know, I. I had challenging questions from, from both sides, you know, and I answered all of them. Um, but I, I found it to be a good experience for HB 1661, not the prior testimony at the Senate hearing. That was not a good experience where people just wouldn't even pay attention to 11 and seven and, and 12 year olds dying from the vaccine. And they just typing away and talking to each other. But let me, um, so again, it seems to have gone well. Let me, uh, read some of the letter that I had sent, um, email, I should say, that I had sent to some of the House members after. So thank you for hosting me for a short description of HB 1661. With great regret, I'm compelled to provide you information regarding the DHHS Bureau Chief's testimony that followed mine. I will wait a few days before I publish this commentary. Uh, my hearing is not good and I couldn't hear the names of the Bureau Chiefs. Uh, one was a man, one was a woman. I'll have to go with these as identifiers here. And a House member asked the Bureau Chiefs if DH, now this, this is all in video. So you, you could say, oh, it's hearsay, but you can go listen to the video. It's there. A House member asked uh, the Bureau Chiefs if DHHS is alarmed about sudden deaths in New Hampshire. The gentleman, Bureau Chief's answer was mere and only included looking at death records database. The gentleman also mentioned that if there was a COVID vaccine caused injury, it would be reported through the US HHS's vaccine adverse re event reporting system. That answer should frighten all of you. If somebody dies, go, go talk to VAERS. You know, we're not gonna investigate in New Hampshire. That's, that's not what the public health in New Hampshire does, really. That, that's pretty frightening. So when asked further by a house member if DHHS was alarmed at the amount and ages of sudden deaths, including a 27 year old and teenagers, and if DHHS was doing anything like forming a committee to look at what is happening, the woman bureau chief answered. She stated that her office focuses on certain indicators and that she had her staff look into the most current death record data to see if there are any vaccine caused adverse effects listing ICD-10 code U12.9. And I explained ICD-10 codes before, right? So what is uh, U12.9? I'll tell you in a minute. But <clears throat> the codes are managed by the WHO. A subset of them is used by the CDC. Remember that. So not, not all ICD-10 codes are adopted by the CDC. It seems that the individual US states only apply codes approved for use by the CDC. In fact, most, if not all states, send death records to the CDC without the ICD-10 codes. The CDC then runs the pros, the words of the death certificates, <clears throat> parts one and two, through the Transaction Acme software. These software programs apply the codes. The death records are then returned with codes to the respective states. If all that the woman bureau chief has ever done to monitor potential vaccine death is to look for U12.9, then she will not find any. And in the hearing, she stated that she did not find any. Neither is U12.9 found in nearly 1 million, and I can now say uh, 1.4 million death records that I have from Minnesota, Massachusetts, and another state. Why? The CDC seems not to have adopted this code from the WHO. A search of CDC's website shows no mention of U12.9. However, a full web search shows that Germany and the United Kingdom have adopted it in the context which follows. There's a stunning notation 
on the WHO's document, which has no official markings on it, but can be found on their website. <clears throat> the notation for U12 prefixes as follows, U12.9. Now here's what it means. COVID-19 vaccines causing adverse effects in therapeutic use, unspecified. Note, this code is to be used as an external cause code. It est as a subcategory under Y59. Remember that. It's to be used under Y59. Other and unspecified vaccines, biological substances. In addition to this, a code from another chapter of the classification could be used indicating the nature of the adverse effect. Correct administration of COVID-19 vaccine and prophylactic therapeutic use as the cause of any adverse effect. Okay. On the website of the Office of National Statistics of the United Kingdom is a very similar notation. I won't read it to you. It's, it's the same wording as WHO. They're saying that, yeah, there's U12.9, but it's a subcategory of Y59, and we're not really using 12.9. And now you know that the CDC has no record of even using it. And your DHHS, the one who's head of all the data, that's the only thing she looked for. And it's not even in use in the United States. And then they're not looking at vaccine deaths in any other way. That is extreme. They call it dereliction of duty, but it's omission of conduct where they have a legal duty to act and to investigate the deaths. Now comes the difficult part to tell you. It's to be used as a subcategory under Y59. Not, not only is there no mention of U12.9 on the CDC website and no use of it on nearly, well, I'll say 1.4 million death certificates, but even the UK and WHO state that it's a subcategory of Y59. <clears throat> Y59 was used on both Massachusetts and Minnesota, and now I can tell you the third state, I've found it in there in the database. Y59 is used in three other states two of them very local to you. Y59.0 means viral vaccines. It appears the New Hampshire Bureau Chief's Health and Statistics and Informatics, Bureau Chief 4, Health, Statistics and Informatics, has not looked for the right information in the death record database. This is basic information I've known for years now. She should have searched for Y59. But that's not the only one. There are plenty of other codes that Transax and Acme software may put out for vaccine caused death. T88.1, also used in Massachusetts and Minnesota death records, means other complications following immunization not elsewhere classified. In Minnesota was also found a T50.9, which means other and unspecified drugs, medicaments, and biological substances. So depending on how it's written, vaccine or vaccination on the death certificate, <clears throat> you'll find that it gets coded differently. Can I just check time? How much? I'm good? Okay. The House members should also know that specific and credible evidence shows that the CDC committed several acts of felony fraud against the people by hiding vaccine-caused deaths. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to skip right to the, the memorandum now. So if you just, Open it up and there are paragraph numbers inside <clears throat> and go to, let's say, page 58. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, on page 58, before paragraph 49, CDC response to journalist inquiry. On July 3rd, that's my birthday. All right. Oh, I shouldn't have said that out public. Everybody knows my birthday now. Almost a 4th of July baby. So on July 3rd, 2023, Aaron Hertzberg published an article in Brownstone Institute entitled, CDC altered Minnesota death certificates that list a COVID vaccine as a cause of death. The article can be found, well, I have, I have all the links are in here. Everything's published. Hertzberg's thesis in the article is an accusation by Hertzberg of fraud committed by the CDC in the omission of ICD-10 codes Y59.0 and T88.1 from Minnesota death certificates that expressly mention vaccine or vaccination in part one or part two. Hertzberg wrote, now here's a quote from the article. 
In almost every death certificate that, that, that identifies a COVID vaccine as a cause of death, the CDC committed data fraud by not assigning the ICD-10 code for vaccine side effects to the causes of death listed on the death certificate. Paragraph 50, on July 5th, 2023 at 9.12 p.m., Greg Piper of Just the News sent an email to media CDC, basically CDC's public relations. The subject was media requests, COVID vaccine death ICD-10 codes withheld, question mark. The body of the email states, hello, this is Greg Piper at Just the News in DC. I wanted to get the agency's response to this reported discovery about your categorization of Minnesota death certificates. On July 6, 2023, 10.46 a.m., Kristen Nordland of CDC Public Affairs replied to Greg Piper of Just the News. The response email from Nordland is an unintelligible word salad seemingly debating the difference between the word vaccine and the word vaccination. The email appears to be an attempt to misinform, disinform, and outright prevaricate expressing that there is no unusual pattern of illness or death resulting from COVID immunizations. Here is the email from Kristen Nordland to Greg Piper. Hi, Greg. Thanks for reaching out to CDC. The claim in the post is incorrect. The ICD-10 codes in question pertain to adverse effects of vaccines, not vaccination. Vaccination is not a disease or cause of death. So simple mention of the vaccine or vaccination without mention of adverse effects will not get coded. Does that make sense to anybody here? Is, is it, when, when I said it's an unintelligible word salad, was I exaggerating? I mean, I'm, that's rhetorical. You don't have to answer. <laughs> um, the examples in this, now here, I go on. This is what she wrote. The examples in this article for which adverse effects codes are included are those that mention adverse or side effects of vaccine. The examples for which the codes are not included do not contain such language. COVID-19 vaccines are undergoing the most intense safety monitoring in U.S. history so intense that they don't look at death certificates that actually say vaccine as a cause of death. To date, CDC has not detected any unusual or unexpected patterns for deaths following immunization that would indicate that COVID vaccines are causing or contributing to deaths outside of the nine confirmed TTS, TTS deaths following the Janssen vaccine. If you're not familiar with the term limited hangout, you should probably look that up. There's a very quick definition of it very easy, where they admit to a small piece so people will go away and not investigate further for the whole truth. And she goes on, when an adverse event, event including death, is reported to CDC's vaccine adverse event reporting system is classified as serious or non-serious. The Code of Federal Regulation defines serious as death, life-threatening illness, hospitalization or prolonged hospitalization, permanent disability, congenital anomalies, or birth defects. For reports, Classified as serious, CDC requests and reviews the available medical records, examines death certificates and autopsy reports. The determination of cause of death is done by, certify, by the certifying official who completes the death certificate or pathologist who conducts the autopsy. Thanks, Kristen. <clears throat> if you go to paragraph one on page You could probably find it faster than me. Let's see. Paragraph one is on page 22. I will skim through this. So we're going to have to go faster. Um, on January 16, 2021, Solomon Kizito died. He was 60 years old. Acute bronchopneumonia and idiopathic thrombocytopenia following COVID-19 vaccination. Vaccination, not vaccine. It does not say side effect of, it does not say adverse effect of. If you look at the codes, the CDC assigned Transax Acne code to be Y59.0, which means viral vaccines. In other words, and this is Massachusetts, Kristen Nordland's excuse to Greg Piper was tailored to the three Minnesota death certificates that have Y59.0. One says side effect of, the other says adverse effect of, and they do not say vaccination, they say vaccine. By tailoring her excuse to the three records that have it written and the other records that say vaccine, vaccination weren't coded, 
So in, in Minnesota, three were coded and the other six that followed were not. In Massachusetts, Solomon Kizito right here, this official government record, proves that she lied to Greg Piper and committed further felony fraud in writing expressly written in her email. It also shows that the CDC is not going to change their ways and is not going to protect the public, nor are they going to investigate the further eight other Massachusetts records that say vaccine and vaccination, all documented in the CDC memorandum right here. Solomon Kizito, after January 16, the Y59 disappears. It's not used again in Massachusetts. And after the three in Minnesota, for the next six, it is not used. This is an automatic software program that applies codes. Yes, they do manual intervention sometimes, but the, if they manually intervene to add Y59, why didn't they do it for the others? Why did they stop doing it to hide vaccine-caused deaths from the American people? And I can tell you that in the third state, I found the same thing. Y59 is coded, the next three are not. One was coded, the next three are not. They did the same thing. Logic will tell you that either they're deleting Y59 after Transaction Acme codes for it, or they're manu they manually stopped coding for it, either of which is an intentional action against the people to hide vaccine-caused deaths from the people. Even the medical examiners and doctors wrote vaccine and vaccination on the death certificate. They wanted us to know. And I can go to, let, let's take a look at who happened first, Brianna. Um, we can go to Brianna's death record. Um, page, well, let me, let me do Diane's first. Page 25, paragraph 5. On March 18, 2021, Diane Dubois died. She was 62 years old. Here's part one of her death certificate. Acute intracranial hemorrhage in the setting of thrombocytopenia in a person treated with COVID-19 vaccination 11 days prior to presentation. It's on her death certificate. This, the, the person who wrote this death certificate wants you to know she died from the vaccine. There are no codes here. Y590 and T881 are absent. This is an omission of a material fact and therefore a false writing on official documents. As a matter of custom and practice, both the, uh, the CDC is guilty. They have been notified. They've been given this document. They've been given other documents. They were contacted by Greg Piper, and they are looking at you and saying, we don't care about New Hampshire. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. <clears throat> Page um, 26 Paragraph seven, this is on the uh, New Hampshire border, very close, um, close to Salem. So Bri Brianna lived in Haverhill, but she grew up in Methuen. She was a high school teacher. She died on March 30, excuse me, on March 30th, 2021, she was injected with a single dose of Moderna. The VAERS report was entered by a practicing nurse uh, a severe headache appears to have been uh, appears to have begun only hours following immunization and sued for days until Brianna was admitted to hospital, then degraded into a seizure, brain lesions, paralysis, and brain activity stopped. So she reacted in hours to the vaccine. She was removed from life support about two and a half weeks later. Brianna died officially on April 15, 2021, at 30 years old. Her death record states non-traumatic cerebral herniation. In other words, she wasn't hit in the head. Ischemic stroke, clots in her head. <clears throat> and um, no mention, no, no Y59 on her death record. It's not there. Now, did they really know? Well, let's find out. Um, I'm going to do this from memory because it's easier, and I, I've presented this a million times. So there were six doctors from Harvard Medical College, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, where she died. And they wrote a brief report in the Neurohospitalist Journal. 
And, in, and the report is titled Fatal Post-COVID mRNA Vaccine Associated Cerebral Ischemia. And that means the vaccine killed her by stroke. They wrote a report about it. In every paragraph of that report, it says the vaccine killed her by stroke. It says where thrombocytopenia is frequent. Remember Diane Dubois? Two weeks before Brianna got injected, she died. If they had investigated her death, and they knew, they wrote it on the death certificate, what killed her. But they covered it up. And because they covered it up, Brianna's dead. So <clears throat> you, you have a society where we sit here and wonder, how can this happen? It can't be. It can't be all lies. This many people can't be involved. But the facts state otherwise. They wrote the report. They said where thrombocytopenia is frequent. They also said where CVSTs, they have a number of reports on. CVST is cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. It's a kind of hemorrhagic stroke. I said, but Brianna didn't have that, but they're common where thrombocytopenia is frequent. They also say they have a number of reports of strokes from COVID vaccinations, plural. In other words, not just the Moderna, not just the Janssen, not just the Pfizer. It's all of them. <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. I mean, you, you see how extensive all these facts are. And these are facts. Can't get away from it. Um, page 28, paragraph 11. <clears throat> on May 23rd, 2021, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a 17-year-old girl was injected with a second dose of COVID immunization. The onset date states June 7. The VAERS report continues. Um, well, I, I, I'm going to read just part of it. So, she got her shot and then she had a headache so bad she went to her primary care physician twice. And when her headache resolved in a week or two, she got her second shot. And the quote is, it then resolved and she got her second vaccine. Massive acute intracranial hemorrhage, large interventricular hemorrhage, massive brain swelling and infarctions. On her death certificate, she died from complications of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. This was five weeks after Brianna. The doctors knew. They knew the vaccine caused stroke. And so the only thing coded was a G08, which means intracranial, intraspinal phlebitis, and thrombophlebitis. So I just told you about three strokes in three women in three months in early 2021, all attributed to the vaccine without a doubt. And yet they hid them. They covered them up. They didn't tell the public about them. And Amaya was 12 years old. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll speak from memory. It's in here. <clears throat> 12 years old. They gave her four shots. They gave her HPV, meningococcal, Tdap, and they gave her her third COVID shot on August 3rd, 2022. I don't know how long the hospital stays were. I'm sure she had the headaches pretty soon after, but she was officially dead on August 29th, same month. Now you could say, well, Eden and Amaya had um, congenital defects in the vasculature of their brains. Okay. Did they deserve to be taken out 10 years earlier than they otherwise would have by this shot? Because we know the shots are killing people by stroke. We know that they're killing people by clots. And then the reason I got all this information is on page 31, paragraph 15. I heard on the radio that a seven-year-old girl died from COVID, and I knew that was, that was a lie. So I looked into it, and I got all these death certificates. And um, so I'll just, I'll just read the paragraph, and then I can move on to some graphs. <clears throat> on, on January 13, 2022, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a seven-year-old girl was injected with COVID immunization, according to VAERS ID 2038120, entered into VAERS on January 15th. That's important. So it was entered on the 15th. And she was injected on the 13th. Now, this is a, a VAERS record, so there's no name. 
And the VAERS record states, severe nausea and vomiting from five minutes post-vaccination and for the next eight to 10 hours. And then the, the, the next field states, spike to 103 degree fever, severe stomach ache. Now, so this is the second vaccination. <clears throat> and that, that other one was for the first vaccination, prior vax. So here's, here's the one about this vaccination. Spiked a 103 degree fever, severe stomach ache, had not had a bowel movement since the day before vaccination, which makes today three days without one. Her, her bowel is shut down. The, I, I assume there's no blood supply there, it's bowel ischemia. There's also been many hemorrhages. If you read through here, and, and I could show you many death certificates where people just started hemorrhaging from their bowels. Or they had ischemia, they, they, their bowels shut down because you can't get a blood supply to it. How can the muscles contract to push food along? First vaccine caused severe numb. I don't have to read that again. Um, so I go on to list the number of uh, VAERS reports and death certificates that are in proximity of... Um, this girl, Cassidy Baraka. It's only only Cassidy Baraka's death certificate fits. If you don't mind me asking, I'm just curious uh, to find out how you got involved in obtaining the data and why you chose to dig in. Yeah, so I, I raised three boys pretty much on my own for a while, and then I lost my son in a motorcycle accident. So I was just sitting there on a couch doing nothing for a couple of years and um, COVID hit and it was basically destroying my other two sons with all the, the rules and everything. Like that's all BS. Cause as an engineer, I know the masks aren't going to work, but why are you asking doctors? The doctor can read the box. They don't understand material properties, material science. They've never studied that. They don't understand fluid dynamics unless maybe they're a vascular surgeon and they might've had to take a course in it. And even then I would challenge them to understand Bernoulli equations, especially with regard to the aortic arch and stuff. So why did they get into it? Because I found that people that specialize in, in purviews, they, they, the solution is right here, but, but they're like this and they can't see it. And just step back and learn a little bit about something else. Like how many people are looking at all the Pfizer trial data? I don't care about it. Do you think the criminal is going to give you the evidence to hang them? They're, they're leaking out that as slowly as they can, the, as slowly as the judge allows. And what are they leaking out? You're not going to find anything in there. There's a couple of things that are like, oh, look what we found. But they have thousands and thousands of people looking at the Pfizer data. Why? We have billions of people who've been injected. We have I mean, I have 1.4 million death certificates that are worth far more than any Pfizer data. That every state has access to the immunization information system of the state, and all they have to do is correlate the names from the IIS to either the death records or the Medicaid and Medicare, because they also have that. And when I said I had whistleblower data, you can imagine what databases get leaked out here and there but if anybody finds out where it came from, they'll throw the person in jail. The data exists. We could solve this in one week in any state that just does, does a thorough investigation. Oh, excuse me. A cursory investigation in a week could put all these vaccines to rest. It is the holy grail of information they will not let out. So why do they get into it? Because I care about all the kids being killed because their parents, I don't want to say, so ignorant people think of as a bad word. It just means you don't know something. There's nothing wrong with the word ignorant. The parents are ignorant because the government has been lying to them and hiding it. And if you understand behavior and systems, and, and I heard somebody mention earlier, um, one, one of you two guys, uh, you know, HHS.gov is, is not running this whole thing. It's a joint, uh, Operation Warp Speed is a joint mission with DOD. Who's DOD going to assign to do it? Oh, that's no, just for distribution. They don't, have, they don't have army cargo trucks driving around the country delivering vaccines. That's not their mission. Their mission is a vaccine in every arm. That's what they were told. That's what they're going to do. And when the smith Month Act part of it was repealed under Obama, that allowed them to propagandize Americans. 
So who got the tap on the shoulder? What division of military? Military intelligence. And what did they do? They infiltrated social media that people like me have been suppressed terribly. They attack people who've been vax injured. People with transverse myelitis were paralyzed from the waist down. People have lost their kids. Cute kid helping out just walked in the room. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Should I wait or continue? Continue? Okay. So, you know, I, I don't just understand like what I read, but also how people interact. That was my job for 30 years is to understand both the formal and informal. And these are all things I've been taught. The formal and informal structure of an organization is they're very different. But formally, what <clears throat> mission were they given? A needle in every arm. What tools do they know? What tactics do they take? They went out and they, they violated the free speech rights of all Americans. Not all, but the ones of us who were telling the truth. They called us misinformation. This is a fact. We know this. If you look at, so Aaron Cariotti's got a case. Um, American First, America First Legal has the FOIA releases. That is in Exhibit H of this. They worked with social media to suppress any voice that was they called anti-vaccine. How about we just wanted to save people's lives from a gene drug therapy never before deployed in humans en masse? And it will never work because those lipid nanoparticle uh, delivery mechanism that they use, is it, I, I don't want to get into all the specifics. And yes, I can have a conversation with a doctor, and I probably know more than any given doctor about the specifics of these, but I will never say I'm an expert. Here, here's an example before I move on. I was in a group, I've been in, I'm in a number of groups, but so a lot of PhDs, a lot of PhDs. One guy was being attacked by his university and they wanted to get rid of him and all the other professors were angry at him. So the history professors, the philosophy professors, the law professors, they are, you get the vaccine, get the vaccine. The three professors that were being attacked, the three professors at this large university that were being attacked were the three immunology professors. They would not get the vaccine. They were being yelled at by the history professors and the philosophy and political science professors. Does that make any sense to anybody? So did I hear you correctly? It was the immunologist professors that did not want the vaccine? They didn't get it. They weren't allowed on campus. There's a lawsuit. I can't really, I, I, I'm afraid to use his name. Uh, it, it's public. I mean, it's Byron Bridal mm -hmm. out of Canada, University of Guelph in Toronto. I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly that it was the yes. other professors ganging up on the immunologist professors, yes. and they're the ones that were refusing the vaccine. Correct. Thank you. Yep. So the, the people should know that, you know, there's, there's evil and then there's just, I'm doing my job. Right. And some of these people from military intelligence are just doing their job. So I personally, I know I've been suppressed on social media. I mostly am on Twitter now called X. Um, I won't get into follower counts and what I saw the needle going backwards, you know, um, and, and especially when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. tweeted about me and got 18,000 likes in six hours and I got zero followers. And I, and I went and I looked at it for half an hour and it, it was like 2997. 3,002, and then within a second, 2,997, 3,005, 2,997, 3,010, 2,997. Anytime they were added, they were subtracted immediately by what appears to be an algorithm. Can't prove anything, but I know that's what I did. I watched my phone. Um, and, you know, I have 30,000 now, which is pretty modest. Most people have hundreds of thousands and for doing what I do. Um, but I, I, I believe that the CDC memorandum... The, the prototypes for this were the Vermont Memorandum, the Minnesota Memorandum, served to the governors, public health commissioners, chief medical examiners, and, and other people within those states. Um, I told you about the Vermont woman. There's another woman in here from Vermont uh, who died, just, just, just a horribly tragic mother. Uh, she had lost her mother, and so she leaves the child uh, without anybody. And... Um, 
pulmonary embolism. And, you know, if you read these things, it says, oh, she was feeling lethargic for a few days. And it's like, yeah, she had a pulmonary embolism. It doesn't just kill you in a second sometimes. You know, it, it takes a while to form, grow, and shut down the ventricle. So, um, yeah, I, all right, let me, let, me, let me get to what I wanted to get to here. If there's anything really important, we should get to that. Okay. That's uh, my checklist. Did that, did that, Coercion Cares Act. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm, go I'm gonna, I'll tell you about Danielle Alvarez. I can find it. And and while you're looking, I just, uh, as a side note, just so you understand, um, we had a uh, industrial hygienist in here a few weeks back to discuss masks and um, how they work. And... Uh, who should be giving guidance on them. So it was very informative. There's a reason why you did not hear from OSHA or NIOSH, those two, the two organizations under HHS.gov. Because if they had come out, they would have had to lie. So you have to find somebody who's going to lie overtly based on data. And they couldn't find anybody, so they had people like Fauci and people who know nothing about medical devices, how they're manufactured, material properties of them, and the, the effectiveness. And um, yeah, a, an industrial hygienist knows that you have to be trained, you have to be fit tested every single time. Uh, they're, they're all just meant as a behavior control mechanism to get people to vaccinate. All right, so I'm, oh, I should just go to the beginning and look at the page number. That's why I made a table of contents. Okay, <clears throat> 97, page 97. If you go to the COVID Humanity Betrayal Memory Project, CHBMP online, you will see hundreds of people who tell their stories, true stories of being murdered in hospitals. Um, they're, they're horrific stories. I've been on several calls with these people, crying into the phone. Um, to, to, people being handcuffed to beds, not being able to see them, being put on drugs they said they do not want to be on expressly. They get put on them anyway so the hospital gets the money because that drug has to be given for the hospital to get the money, remdesivir. All right, so at the bottom of page 97, Danielle, in October 2023, um, her mom gave me a bunch of records. Um, Danielle Kathleen Alvarez was admitted on August 27, 2021. I have the names of uh, the doctors. Uh, so Heather Maselman, Jincy Jacob was a nurse. They started her on, um, so she was at, they entered the order at um, 3.04 p.m. to give her remdesivir. So as soon as they get a positive COVID test, bam, they hit her with that remdesivir. So her vital signs. 97.9 temperature, 82 beat per minute heart rate, 119 over 87 blood pressure, 15 breaths per minute. Sound like she was struggling? She wasn't struggling. There's no struggle. <laughs> um, all right, then they started hitting her with the courses of remdesivir. I, I have a lot of details in here. I'm just gonna kind of skip, but I mean, 97.3, 81 beats per minute. She's nervous. She's uh, learning disabled. She's alone. Her mom isn't allowed to be with her. Uh, pulse ox, it was down to 94%. And then on page 99, um, just more, more data. I'm giving you leading up to the uh, ventilation. I guess at this point, I just, this is a, number, a lot of pages. I'll just say the facts are here. 
and, and these can be used to convict these people of murder. They murdered this girl. Um, now, I guess I'll finish up with some graphs. If you go to, oh, look what I just I, I just want to make sure, um, you know, we keep mentioning the remdesivir. Yeah. But you mentioned early that you don't know if it was remdesivir. You're not saying it's correct. remdesivir. Is that correct. correct? That is correct. Thank you. And there are a lot of people are going to be very mad at me for not saying, it's remdesivir. I, I'm not a cheerleader for anything. I go by facts and, and data and evidence. And so I don't have the evidence that it's remdesivir. What I have the evidence of is that the government is not investigating one of the largest mass casualties in the history of the United States. They just don't care. Acute renal failure. They just don't care. I told you 150,000. So, well, a million were killed by COVID. No, they weren't. That's a lie. I also have in here, I told you, all the fraud that occurred. Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey drove the fear of this pandemic because they had the most to gain. It was all a game. It was all gamed out from the very beginning. The CARES Act was written in 2018. A couple of variables were tweaked in 2020. And they passed it. They just pass it. Whatever the lobbyist hands them. Here, pass this. It's behavior modification to get the doctors to do what they want. All right, go to page 258, please. I'm not, I'm not going to do too many because there, there are 400 graphs in this. <clears throat> By the way, you, you can buy this on my website. <laughs> you can buy it at Amazon, too. Um, that's the, the, the change names version. The other version that went to the uh, CDC, FDA, NIH had real real names. And that's only, uh, about, like I said, about four or five people, names are changed. So on page 258, if you've heard of turbo cancer, this is it. Now the difference in 2020 in the top left graph, and 2020 is up, well, you had 8,800 excess deaths in a matter of nine weeks in 2020 from mid-March to mid-June. That's a lot of old people. The average death, uh, the average age of, of uh, COVID and, and the average age of excess death was 81 in Massachusetts. And that, that all happened in nine weeks. So you have a lot of people that had lymph node cancer and they were kind of cleared out by whatever there was done to them, mostly neglect. You know, doctors will say, you died of COVID. But I, I interviewed a, a medical examiner for three and a half hours and reviewed hundreds of death certificates with him. And he told me, we didn't do blood labs. We didn't do imaging. We didn't do tissue samples. We called up the old folks home, said what happened. And they said, well, she was 95, was coughing and died. It's like, okay, COVID, 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 COVID. Everything was COVID. And they didn't do their jobs because they were afraid of the dead bodies. But a doctor would know dead bodies don't breathe. Just use gloves, which they use anyway. They weren't going to die from the dead bodies, but they were afraid anyway. They bought into the fear. So when you look at this and you see that 2020 has risen, it should actually go down after 2020. There should be a deficit because you've, you've pulled people forward. They call it a pull forward effect. I hate that term. But I, I, I say you've cleared out the dry tinder, right? People are, had something and they were going to die anyway over the next six to 12, maybe 24 months. Well, they were pulled into that window of time of nine weeks when they kind of weren't cared for. The staff didn't show up at the, a lot of the old folks' homes. If you don't walk a 95-year-old down the hallway twice a day, they can't, it, it doesn't contract their calves and, and, that, and push the blood back up, right? <clears throat> so if you just say, here, wear a mask and lie in bed for two weeks until we get the staff to walk you around again. They're dead from either pneumonia or a DVT throwing a clot to a PE within two weeks. So most of the people that died from COVID, it was neglect. And, and once all these old people died, then in 21, you have people dying, and I'm not going to say cancer, lymph node cancer specifically, but what you have is a shift of 16 years in the excess deaths. So the excess deaths <clears throat> were, were 81 in 2020 in Massachusetts. And the, the middle of the range of excess deaths was 16 years lower in 2021. Figure that one out. And, and the average age of COVID death was not in that range. The average age of COVID death in, in 2021 was 75.8. 
but it was 65 on average of the excess deaths. So people were dying of not COVID, something else, 10 years younger. And that's a 10x. So you say, oh, people died from, a million people died from COVID. Well, first of all, no, they didn't. It's about 90, maybe 80 to 90% fraud. And if you actually believe those numbers and the, and the age was 81, and the real age of the excess that is occurring from not COVID, let's say 100,000 of them died. Let's say only, let's be conservative. I'll say a million, but 100,000 of them. But, but they died an average of 10 years younger. That's 10 times the life years lost. That's a million life years lost. And the people that it affects, when, it, when I'm sorry, but when an 85 year old dies, you know, and I, most of my family is, is gone, the, the, the next generation. My father was born in 1918. He cut down trees in the CCC camps in the Great Depression in New Hampshire, swinging an ax, because the saw was too fast. So it's sad when somebody 85 dies, but how about a 45 year old with three kids? And what pathologies then manifest in those three children as they grow up? Depression, drug addiction, all kinds of stuff. Uh, getting back to this, I'm trying to tell you that the 21 and 22 numbers that you see here that are skyrocketing and 23 is also very high. It's not on here. <clears throat> the, these are, these multiply out to life years lost that are 10, 15, and 20 times that of anything from COVID. And I guess uh, uh, I just want to hit one thing before I finish up. Um, you want me to finish up, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so before I finish up, Kevin McKernan is, is um, there are a lot of graphs. Check, check them out. You guys have this now. Uh, keep it free. Kevin McKernan uh, managed the Human Genome Project at MIT for a number of years. He now is the Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics in Massachusetts. Um, he's a world-leading genetics expert. He uh, did a DNA sequence of the vaccines and accidentally found contamination um, in the area of sequences that cause both oncogenesis, so cancer promotion, and uh, tumor suppression. So if you have a way to make cancers grow faster, you got it. And if you have a way to suppress your ability for those tumors to grow, you got that too. Um, I, I don't know that stuff very well. I try to shy away from it. But what you need to know is it's there. We know it's there now, not to any degree of a small amount. So your body is, if you get the injections, you bought the mRNA injections, your body is producing proteins that we don't know what they are. It's supposed to be the spike protein, which is a glycoprotein, right? And it resembles staphylococcus enterotoxin B, which is a toxin. It also, re then you hear, oh, it's snake venom. Okay, it's not snake venom, but it resembles the protein that is the toxin that is in snake venom and box jellyfish and Portuguese man of war and scorpions and hymenoptera. Um, if you were to mandate hymenoptera stings, oh, hymenoptera uh, bees, hornets, wasps, and red fire ants are hymenoptera. Okay, oh, let's just say bee stings. About 20 to 40 people die each year in the, United, in the United States from bee stings. If you were to mandate bee stings for everybody, 20,000 people would die in the United States from bee stings. So what you have is a death lottery that you've mandated upon the people. And so people say, well, I got it and it didn't hurt me. Hey, good luck to you. You know, put another, put another chamber in the revolver, uh, put another uh, a bullet in the chamber in your revolver, spin it. Now you get two in there. Oh, three, four, five. So if your chances are one in a thousand, by the time you take your fifth one, it's five in a thousand. I'm not taking that chance. It's a death lottery. There's another article I wrote, Moral Calculus of a Death Lottery, if you want to see the deductive syllogism of, of all that. Now, so Kevin found the DNA. It's in there. And lastly, I will say, I, I, I talked about duties before. Um, so it, it, don't take this the wrong way. I mean, I sat down with the Attorney General, John Promella, for 45 minutes with um, uh, representatives um, Yuri Polosov and Jason Gerhard. That was uh, over a year ago. 
And I reviewed even more uh, New Hampshire people who died in Massachusetts hospitals that I had the records of. They were, they were, they were surprised. And uh, when I say they, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but the criminal justice bureau chief, uh, they, they were kind of surprised at what I had. And where did you get that? I said, I have them legally from Massachusetts. I know it's a felony if I have them from direct, directly from New Hampshire. And they were kind of almost disappointed, I think. But we had a, we had a, a good discussion. Um, I got them to crack a smile a couple of times. And in the end, uh, uh, I said, I even, I even got this guy to laugh. And, and they laughed. And then I said, and you've been given notice and you have a legal duty to act on information and belief that people are dying in New Hampshire from, from this. You, you have a legal duty to investigate it. I don't know what happened after that. So I'm, I'm going to, and they walked me out and the smiles were gone, by the way. <laughs> but um, so you guys have a duty to uh, make a criminal referral once you digest this information. I've told you about felonies that are occurring to New Hampshire citizens by the CDC that the HHS or Homeland Security is not going to investigate. They don't investigate their own. Do not rely on them. You have a duty to the citizens of New Hampshire whom you represent. So I, I, would, I would say make a, ask the <clears throat> uh, attorney general to petition district judge to immediately impanel a special grand jury with a special prosecutor. Special prosecutor, use your special prosecutor law. If you want, I will, I will go through the New Hampshire law to try to find that legal path for you to do so. Um, I don't believe that you can wait to do your full investigation. You now know of crimes by the CDC. And, and the um, uh, US attorneys are not gonna pursue this. The DOJ is not going to pursue this. They do not investigate their own. And so we, we cannot get to a federal grand jury, but states have their own grand juries. And you know, New, New Hampshire, yeah, the grand jury law you have is, is not that great. Um, the, the, the Northwest and Western states have better laws based on the way they were kind of set up and founded. You know, we have really old laws here that predate our constitution. Um, out West, the district judges would come around like once a year. And so they, they have the ability to deputize people and uh, they have board of county commissioners that have certain powers that we don't have here. Um, but uh, again, so have them ingress, investigate criminal matters that caused the deaths of thousands of New Hampshire residents and several hundred thousand Americans, if not more than a million already. So I, I, I'm ending by saying, please, uh, you have that duty. I hope you'll at least look into it. Um, attorney generals, and again, I look at si overall systems, behavior, uh, informal and formal uh, political structures within organizations. Anyone who is an attorney general has accepted that position as a, as a politician, and that is their uh, career choice. Any attorney general that even attempts to put together an investigation of pharma is going to have the wrath of trillions of dollars against them, and they will never work in politics again. And, and this goes for any red state, as red as you can get. They, they're, they're afraid their entire career will be ruined. So it takes, <clears throat> um, you need to box them in a corner and force them to impanel a grand jury. Petition the district judge, make sure it's happened. And you can't use a state attorney because state attorneys are also on that career path. That's why a special prosecutor is so important. You bring in somebody who's retired, who cares about the people of New Hampshire, not his own job. And I'm not saying anything bad about all the New Hampshire state attorneys. I'm just saying it's a fact that when, you, when you're in that world, you, you, you see things through a lens that is not necessarily for the people, but for your career path and, and what's good for you and your family. So um, please attempt to do that. And, you know, I, this is a long time that you've heard me and I really appreciate it. I think um, it, it, was, it was tough. I've got so much in my head and I speak for two, sometimes four hours straight from memory. I don't even need all the, the, the written words. Um, this is real. And it has to be done at the state and county levels. And the federal government is killing your people. And it's not an accident. Thank you very much for your time. Does anyone represent Belcher? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much for all your testimony. This has been very uh, comprehensive. 
Um, certainly can't make any promises as to what we're going to do or what our report will contain, but we will certainly look at all of these things and consider them all. Um, I would like to take a moment, if, if it's allowable, to speak to uh, the committee and to the public at large, um, because we've just heard a lot of things, and I think from my personal perspective, I think some things are, are fairly likely. I think other ones may be a little less likely. I'd like to look at them all a little bit more myself, but I do want to just, because I'm sure people heard both here and at home things today that are going to challenge them a little bit. Maybe they've heard it for the first time. Maybe these things even sound a little bit outlandish to them. Um, so I'd like to tell you just for a moment about, about a personal experience of mine. Um, and I can't speak to everything that we've just heard. Uh, but I, I did receive a single dose of an mRNA vaccine. Um, I was a little skeptical at the time. So I went through the process of being tested for antibodies to make sure that I hadn't actually had COVID before I received it. I didn't, so I went forward. I received a single dose. Um, within 12 hours, I was extremely sick. Within 24 to 48 hours, I had severe hypertension, roughly 180 over 110 Increased heart rate, I developed neurological problems, a severe headache. I was hospitalized for the better part of a week where I nearly died. I was treated with heparin because I was clotting. I developed autoimmune issues. I developed dysautonomia. I developed heart problems, migraines, and seizures, among other things. That's not merely my opinion. That is the opinion of the physicians who have been treating me since 2021. Now... Uh, this is not dispositive for the rates of these sort of things happening, but I just want people to understand that some of the things we've heard today, I can verify they're real and they have happened to some people, at least. I can say that when I was diagnosed originally, um, there was an odd thing that happened. My neurologist went to enter the diagnostic code and discovered that Despite for many vaccines, there being specific diagnostic codes for a vaccine related injury or illness for COVID vaccine, there was no code. It had to be a generic entry for a generic vaccine injury or illness. So that's going to provide a complication, I think, for us moving forward in our investigation to try to determine the frequency of some of these things. Um, and the other thing I would say is we've already read into the record in this committee, and they are in our record. People can access that. Uh, some issues that have been well documented via major studies in prominent journals that include uh, the Journal of Nature, mRNA frame shifting, producing random proteins in a large percentage of cases, DNA contamination, particle contamination, issues with the lipid nanoparticles, mRNA uh, located systemically in the body, not merely locally, uh, reverse transcription of mRNA in liver cells, health signals for heart problems, neurological problems, as well as IgG4 production really, uh, uh, leading to immune deficiency in some people. Um, so again, I can't, this is not just positive for frequency. I just want the people at home and, and elsewhere to understand that though we've heard some things that might uh, challenge you today, I can verify that at least some of this has happened in some frequency. So I'd like, I, I hope we will continue to look into that. And thank you. Representative Lucas. I just <clears throat> I have a question about one of your graphs. I'm just in the um, first page of graphs that you gave us of the individual sheets, and you were pointing out the great increases in 2021, but I noticed that for clots and brains, the increases in 2022, and I'm just wondering if you had any information as to why that might be. You know, a lot of these are just my guesses and I don't like to do that in testimony. You know, is it the third shot? Is it the, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I've put forth theories. And I've been told I was wrong by doctors and six months later, as they come later, they come back and say, Oh, you were right. Like I said, there's a pH imbalance in the blood. Uh, John, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. That that's not happening. Six months later, a paper comes out. There's a pH imbalance in the blood. Now, why did I say that? Because I had the death certificates in which 
there were a lot of blood and blood forming. Everything changed. Uh, now, in my presentation, I say, so respiratory excess deaths occurred in 2020. And this is Massachusetts, okay? It's different for different places. New Hampshire is very different from Massachusetts. I believe that your people were more honest in filling out death certificates. I really believe that. Um, <clears throat> so respiratory in 2020, it shifted to circulatory and blood in 2021. And then you have acute problems like, you know, endothelial scoring uh, through apoptosis by transfection, and then you have T-cell attack of parts of your endothelium. So if you take a direct vein injection, like Mark Giraudot's bolus theory, um, it, there's a chance, maybe one in 50, maybe 200, we don't know, but it, it's in that range. Uh, if the tip of the needle is near a vein, you're going to take a, a vein hit where the blood is returning, right? So it's returning, but you take a whole bunch all at once and it goes to like one place. And through fluid dynamics, I think that they tend to aggregate where um, when, when you get to the edge of something where fluid flows through, it slows down. So that the theoretically, the air at your windshield is not moving, but it gets compressed, but there's certain molecules that are just sitting there, right? Um, and if it all gets, all, all of that mRNA goes to one place, that's where I believe the aortic dissections are occurring, and um, you get a hole balloon through your aorta. Why? I mean, is that normal? No. No, people have problems, excuse me, people have problems for a long time that then manifest in an aortic dissection. They don't just get a shot, and then, you know, a week later, they're dead, like, um, like Victor Samoz. You know, he's from New York, moved to Washington. He's in here. You read his about the aortic, aortic dissection. And you look in the uh, Minnesota data, aortic dissections. So I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question. I, I just don't, don't know how to answer it, but. That's fine, thank you. Representative Polozov. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for presenting it and taking my question. So you talked about different uh, risk factors that uh, looks like they contributed to the excessive deaths that we are seeing. You talked about lack of care, you talked about ventilators, you talked about COVID vaccines, and you talked about vecular remdesivir. And we already heard about most of it, but you also mentioned vancomycin. So I just wonder if you can follow up and later send us send the committee some documents about uh, when commission and uh, if the, w what are concerns about the drug, what are side effects uh, from when commission uh, possible? Yeah, it's uh, Representative Polisov, vancomycin is, is pretty commonly used. Um, and, and it's known that in overdose situations, it causes kidney failure. There's plenty of papers on it. I, I can't provide you any more than you could do by just typing it in DuckDuckGo uh, rather than that other search company that is against the people. <laughs> so, I, and you'd, you'd probably know more about vancomycin than I would. Representative Betch Belcher and then Representative Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was going to wait a little later on this, but I'd like to just quickly read one item into the record, which I will provide a bit later. Um, study available from the uh, NIH website from December 2022 titled to aspirate or to not aspirate considerations for COVID-19 vaccines in which the abstract goes on to explain that despite it being um, common practice for a very long time, it was not recommended that aspiration occur with COVID-19 vaccination for some reason. And to describe what that is, uh, when you when you do an intramuscular injection, there you're trying well you're trying to put it in, the drug into the musculature, which is where it's then supposed to remain for the most part. But obviously within your body, there's not just muscle. Even within the musculature, there are veins and there are arteries. There's actually a loop that goes around the the, the tip of the humerus. That's an artery that can be hit. Um, so typically, when you're trained to administer an intramuscular vaccine, you insert the needle and then you pull back on the plunger, which is aspiration to see if you get blood, which would indicate you're in a blood vessel rather than a muscle. Uh, again, the study goes on to explain that this was not recommended for the COVID-19 vaccine. So that's another angle that we'll probably want to take a look at. Thank you. May I comment on that? Sure. Okay. So the CDC puts out the pink book 
It's about what he just said. And it was put out uh, by two nurses. And in the pink book, they say, do not aspirate because needle wiggle may cause discomfort. They further say in the paragraph that they have no scientific basis for this. They just feel that the patient would be more comfortable if you inject quickly. Not, not, not just not aspirate, but also inject quickly, which another thing like Mark Giraudot says, inject very slowly and you'll have a lot less, a lot fewer people dying. So where did that come from? It came, look, look up the pink book. Uh, if, if you buy my book, you can just look at the references and it's in there. Um, and, and that's online under the CDC. That's where that came from. And there's no scientific basis for not doing what was custom and practice prior to COVID. So they're killing a lot of people simply by balls injection. And it doesn't even mean, matter if it's the COVID vaccine. That if you do that with the flu vaccine or any others, you'll see deaths rise. You'll see anything that transfects cells, anything that's going to be, you know, you're bypassing your mucosal defenses. How do things get in your body? You put them in your body or you're taking it in through the air. Your lungs have very strong mucosal defenses. You're bypassing that by going directly into your body with an injection of stuff you don't even know what it is with the manufacturing controls that are so terrible is contamination. Uh, but one, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, with some of the smaller ones, when you do aspirate, you have immediate collapse by, through the, 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 the physics of it. And because you collapse it, it pulls it through the other side. And now you're, out, you're not in the vein e anymore either. So aspiration alone uh, isn't foolproof, but it's, it's another measure that helps. So yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. Thanks. Yes, <clears throat> going back um, to earlier, and you had commented that there was enough information within months to shut down shut down the whole process from the um, deaths that happened same day. You know, eleven deaths you said happened the same day. So I'm wondering what is normal as a comparison. Okay, so um, that comment was in the context of looking at VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which was put in place for, it, it was to appease the anti-vax crowd years ago. I think it's a terrible system, but it's what we have. And as bad as it is, the signal, and I say the signal, right? So what is normal? Um, the, the problem with saying, oh, all these things are now in, in bears that are so much more than before, the, 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 my easy counter argument was, yeah, people are a lot more aware, aware of this vaccine. And so they're going crazy making bears reports where they didn't make reports before. You know, you can always come up with an excuse, one side versus the other. But when you look at the number of deaths, and, and so what I did is I went in and I correlated the death certificates to the bears reports. So I know the person actually died. It's not a BS report. These people really died, and I get their injection dates, and I know what they died from. They didn't die from pneumonia. They didn't die from COVID. They died from a pulmonary embolism. They died from thrombocytopenia, post-hemorrhagic anemia. Did you see the po go look? When you're done, just remember post-hemorrhagic anemia. Take a look at that one. Now, cardiac arrest, uh, writing the paper on it now, um, there's a major bug in the entire CDC, excuse me, WHO system and the CDC of how to categorize cardiac arrest. Uh, I, I don't have time to explain it right now, but the entire system is, is messed up. Um, so you have scientific papers being written on data that's it's not fraudulent, it's, it's, it's errant. It, it lacks integrity and in understanding of what a cardiac arrest is. You know what cardiac arrest means? Think of the word, the heart stopped. Okay, the guy got COVID, then he got pneumonia, then he died of cardiopulmonary arrest, and it gets listed as heart disease. It doesn't. It, it and it's 16 to 19 percent of all deaths in Massachusetts have I-46. Sorry to deviate, but I. Any other questions? You know, I can talk for four Representative hours. Representative, pulls off. <laughs> It's not a question, but follow up. Uh, I I want to um, I want some time to submit uh, uh, several papers to the record and share it with the committee to discuss after lunch break. If now is a good time. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, Unless it, somebody else have a question to the no. presenter. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Does anyone need a five-minute break? Okay. <laughs> Let's take a five-minute break, and then maybe you can start uh, reading your papers, okay? Uh, and I'd like to thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for the time. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the voice. I will bring these up to you, and then I'm done, right? You are. All right. Thank you. Out to the rain again. Thank you.
Um, if I could get everyone to take their seat uh, so we can uh, break for lunch shortly. <laughs> Representative Belcher. <laughs> uh, Representative Polzoff, you wanted to uh, uh, introduce something into the record? Yeah, yeah, yeah there's uh, like uh, f five, uh, five pages I want to introduce to record. So um, in previous session, we heard a lot that uh, from specialists that kids uh, are not uh, the target vulnerable population for COVID and those measures are misapplied when applied for kids. But is there any data to back it up? So I looked it up and that's what uh, I found. So if you go an HDHHS wizard data on minor COVID deaths, uh, 2020, 2024, ages 0 to 9, you will find that for all this COVID years, there's only a single death for that population. On the other side of that paper, ages 10 to 19, uh, how many uh, New Hampshire uh, residents in that age died from COVID? Uh, zero, zero. So in total, under 19 years old, uh, only, only, only single death documented. Uh, and if you go to the next one, uh, name is CDC Whiskers, New Hampshire causes uh, of death data. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a little bit small font. So if you turn it around, uh, I multiply. Uh, this is a, a better view of ages uh, one to four, and you can see. Uh, n n number four, uh, cause of death for that ages uh, for, uh, for uh, is uh, uh, pretty long. It's a combination of uh, COVID-19, diabetes, mellitus, heart disease, influenza, pneumonia, and septicemia. And why this specific combination, as, as you saw in previous document, it's because there was only one case, and that one case uh, was actually a specific New Hampshire resident that was already dying from diabetes, heart disease, flu, etc. Uh, but also was tested positive for COVID, so COVID listed as a, a primary uh, death. And as that person died, not in New Hampshire hospital, uh, but outside. And uh, you, you heard from previous presenter that that might be the reason why COVID and not, for example, diabetes was listed because those states are not as uh, accurate and kind of overstated number of deaths. But uh, even with that, like, so for all these years, there's only a single kid who died from COVID official data from CDC and DHHS. Uh, and uh, and uh, that uh, that picture was uh, combined not by some Republicans, it's by NAMI, uh, uh, pretty uh, ultra left organization. So it's 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 uh, nonpartisan agreement that that's what happened. And the last one is a uh, uh, query from uh, Virus: uh, the vaccine adverse event reporting system results. Uh, so I query several age ranges for New Hampshire residents uh, under 17, uh, up to 18 years. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, those of them who died, so you can see that there are uh, four, four New Hampshire residents uh, and uh, multiple awful symptoms that uh, went after they took uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, for those people. And uh, being on House Health uh, Human Services and Elderly Affairs Committee, everyone on our committee knows that uh, the number of reports, uh, the reports to virus database are severely underreported. Many many injuries and deaths don't end up being here. So, but even with that, we see that in New Hampshire, 
not a single otherwise healthy kid died from COVID, but an, a number of kids died uh, after receiving COVID-19 vaccine. And I think it's very concerning. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Polozov. Uh, we'll get that into the record. Um, uh, to continue our discussion from earlier today, discuss some uh, questions that we have and uh, what we want answered for this committee. I'd like to continue that discussion. Does anyone have anything specific? Representative Evil. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was sort of uh, thinking about the federal funds issue in particular, and I just made some notes. Um, maybe we could get a timeline like we have for the COVID vaccine rollout for the federal funds, identify um, where they were coming from and, and how they started to be distributed maybe zero in on the amount of money, the process of distribu distribution, to whom it was distributed, and, and whether uh, or how the use of the funds was, was tracked, and then maybe if there's some uh, measures of success. So I think that uh, maybe Taylor Caswell can help us with that. And then I know that there is on some state websites a listing of how the funds were distributed. So I don't think that should take a lot of extra accounting from him. And then we could sort of look at the federal funds that were used for health orientation kind of a thing. And then I know many funds were used for, for infrastructure. So I don't know how other people feel about that, but that seemed like if we were going to uh, talk to Taylor Caswell, that might be a way of focusing the discussion. I, I think that's a great idea, and I like the idea of focusing on, on the successes. Um, I think it's important uh, that not only we find what the issues are, but we really need to find out what we did well in New Hampshire. Um, because I think, like, and even uh, our former speaker said that New Hampshire got it he thought we got some of the things right. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that we need, you know, we didn't follow everything that every other state did. And I think that's a plus for us. And so I think also looking at our successes to see what we did right is also important to highlight in the, in the report. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Um, I do know I have sent an email to uh, Commissioner Caswell um, to see his availability. I'm still waiting to hear back. I'm hoping to hear back from Director Buxton also of their availability. I mean, you know, I think where we're not meeting, I mean, Fridays does seem to be an okay day for most of us, but if we have to change our day uh, to accommodate these folks, um, I would definitely give the committee a heads up, but I think um, because we really want to hear from them and we also want to hear from Dr. Chan that we need to maybe accommodate their schedules also. Um, well, and I, I remember when we spoke to the speaker, he said, you know, after crossover, one of the limiting factors was all our work, but the other thing was the, um, the availability of meeting rooms. He said maybe after crossover, mm -hmm. would, we'd have a little bit more latitude. Um, and I think he mentioned Wednesday, or you and I uh, talk. I know you have a work schedule, though. Everybody's got their schedules. Um, if you want, I was just going to offer, I could just dash off a few of these things that I just said for you, and then that way if you wanted mm -hmm. to change it or whatever, you could send it to uh, Commissioner Cass. Sure, if you would like to. And if anybody has any questions that we've discussed, if you just want to email them to me, then I will forward them on. I think it, you know that way... Uh, it'll be in one central place, and it will just make it easier um, that way, and we're not being duplicative of yeah. the questions we're asking. Um, so does anyone else have anything else that we need to look at? But I agree with uh, you, Representative Ebel. I think that uh, we need to look at the monies. I actually have it. So then the other person is the Homeland Security Director. So, I mean, obviously we should ask him about his, the current preparation of the report, what they're looking at, what the status is. And then, um, I mean, 
it's hard to know exactly what to ask him. I think mm -hmm. we'll, maybe we'll say where our focus from our mission is a special look at, mm -hmm. at health. I don't know. Um, okay. um, what I have done when I have emailed these, uh, these folks is I am actually giving them a copy of what, of what our mission statement is so they have an understanding of what this committee is. Um, and I think it's important that they have that. Um, uh, so that is what I am doing, just so there, it's not a, oh, what is this committee? So, Representative Lekas. I didn't think we were just health. I thought we were. Oh, education. Is the yeah, because that's, that's a big, that it had a huge yeah. effect on well, education. I was trying to remember that. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear with that microphone. It's a little bit loud in this corner. Uh, Representative Lekas was saying, we don't want to just focus on health, we want to focus on the educational aspect. Um, but, but, but I do believe that the two go hand in hand because with the shutdown of schools, it affected the, you know, we're, we're dealing with mental health issues and other health things, which in turn, and also, you know, looking at air filtration systems and even ongoing to make sure that our schools have the proper air, air filtration systems in them. Uh, for any upcoming pandemic or even the flu season um, to help mitigate those, I think is an important um, thing to look at. That, that would be an advantage of this committee is that, Just speaking to microphone. that would be an advantage to this committee is that things that we find that are helpful, that would have been helpful or that were helpful in COVID-19 is they can be used for lots of other issues like the flu because that's that takes out huge numbers of kids and teachers every year flu season and so if they get the proper if they get a nice system that's going to would have worked or did work for covid and they use the covid monies for that yes that continues on and keeps that may negate the flu season. Right. I'm not saying that it's going to eliminate it, but it could possibly help. And I'm, you know, but the flu could act completely different than COVID. And that's, uh, yeah. it's, it's the other thing. We just don't know everything at Representative Evil. Yeah, I found the um, email that we got from Trisha Tilly on what the Homeland Security report was going to cover. So it was preparedness, command, communication, decision making, financial management. So that is also federal funds, yeah. right? Um, and other. And then health and medical, logistics, private public partnerships, and public information. So um, I think financial management and health and medical. I mean, I do think the education piece sort of feeds into health because what they were doing was because of health reasons, right? Exactly. So, I mean, anyway, that's what he's uh, that's what he's covering. So I don't know if we want to select out some of those we're particularly interested in, or if you just want to have him come in and talk. Well, I think, um, I mean, private-public partnerships. I'm not sure we'll dive deep in that. Representative Blackus. Yeah, I have, and I can make copies if people are interested, but um, the Indiana Attorney General did a report that's s sort of a subset maybe of what we're doing just to see what they did and what questions were asked and what information they got. It's the analysis of COVID-19 positivity rate data and death statistics statistics and the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 mitigation policies. And so I can make everybody a copy of this if you're interested or you can just look you're at it. Maybe get it up on your phone. Yeah, yeah we can do that. I got it. I yeah. got it. Maybe there's just a link you could Oh, there probably I can do that cuz this came from a link in and, and and if you could it. send the link we can get uh uh it up on our website. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but if anyone wants a copy, please let Representative Vuckus know. Uh, Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I just wanted to make a, a, a quick um, argument point regarding the, um, the upcoming DHHS report that we are going to be receiving and looking at. Um, um, just, just for clarification, it's Homeland Security. Oh, yes. My apologies. Yes. 
So the report that we're going to be uh, looking at receiving is going to come from the executive branch, obviously with our form of government, the three branches of government, we have each other in check and we have a responsibility to, um, to keep each other in check in the various ways that were delegated to us by the constitution. Um, as such, I think it's very important that we look at this report as a very good thing that we can utilize in our efforts here, um, as a part of what we're doing, but it's also at the same time, very important to not look at it as dispositive and simply, um, file it away and say, yep, this is, this is what it is. It's, it's very important for us to anything that we find uh, important in our, in our goals here to verify the veracity of it, uh, which may mean duplicating efforts, but that, that is just part of our, I think, responsibility from the legislative side. Uh, well, I think that the timing of the report, which will be out, is supposed to be out according to, um, Ms. Tilly, uh, is the end of June. Um, we will not be meeting in July or August, so that will give us a chance to uh, purview the report and um, when we come back in the fall, maybe have, uh, if we have any questions, we can uh, address them then. Um, that if you think that there's something that we've discovered that report differs from or if the what the positives in the report are that we agree with I mean I think it's important um, not to also look for the positives so um, uh, Trisha Tilly did write us a uh, email to see if we had more questions for her and I didn't know if there'd been any response to that or if we have something more. So I did send off a list of questions to her. I was lax in getting those questions to her, so I would give her some latitude in getting them back to her, to us. But I also believe that some of the questions may be on her purview. Um, and I let her know as such that if she thought they were and maybe if she knew who they could be directed to to let, let me know. Um, I can absolutely share the the email that I sent to uh, Ms. Tilly. You. You're welcome. Does anyone else have anything else? If not, uh, we'll adjourn for lunch, and we will be back here at 1 p.m. I understand, and I hope anyone, everyone be safe that's leaving on the roads. Um, it's a rainy one. Take care.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to open up uh, the afternoon session on the, for the Special Committee for a COVID Response. And um, I would like to ask uh, if anyone from the public would like to come up and speak. Uh, please introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, and uh, tell us what you want us to hear. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Tara Hafey, and I live in Brentwood, New Hampshire, uh, with my husband and my two daughters. Um, I'm here today to talk about our experience with COVID and specifically around the reaction from school, how that impacted our family, and then on to the vaccine, COVID vaccine and the reactions that we had. On August 4th, 2021, my youngest daughter, who is now 20, was injured by the COVID vaccine, a vaccine that she did not want to get, but had to in order to attend college to achieve her goal of becoming a medical professional. Um, just to tell you a little bit about my daughter, she was 16 and a junior in high school when COVID started when the school shut down um, she was wrapping up her or starting to wrap up her junior year college applications um, she had just bought her junior prom dress and she bought heels for the prom and the heels were a big deal for her because she has had a chronic pain condition that started when she was 12 years old but she overcame it and so for her, that purchasing of a prom, buying heels that she could go to her prom with was a big deal. Um, so she'd overcame the chronic pain disease. Her leg hurt, but she could function. Nobody knew that she wasn't. She was competing varsity gymnastics at her high school. Uh, she was also doing competitive gymnastics at one of the local club gymnastics facilities. Uh, she also competed nationally as a competitive jump roper, doing events like speed and double dutch and a whole variety of things. So she was a really active, active kid. Um, she'd always been active, you know, her things to do were jump on the trampoline, do flips, yoga, hang out with friends, hiking, all of that stuff. Um, I don't know if you're interested, but I, for instance, I have a picture of her summer of 2020 hiking mount major um, at the top of it just so excited to be standing at the top of the mountain um, because she could um, it was fantastic um, when covid first hit the school things were tough and shut down you know at first we really understood it we you know two weeks it made sense let's do this was our in our mind but then as more and more data came out it wasn't making sense to keep these kids out of school um my oldest she was a freshman in college at the time she came home from college in march of 2020 and did not go back that year um, while she was home taking classes remotely for the remainder of her freshman year and all of her sophomore year she was a frontline worker at a supermarket um, and at that point, we were like, why is it that she can go day in, day out, serve hundreds of customers, people she doesn't know, but she can't go sit in a classroom with her peers and, and learn and get her education. Um, so again, as more and more data came out, it started to become clear that younger, healthy people were at minimal risk of severe reaction, severe cases of COVID. Um, we knew that it was individuals with comorbidities. We knew that it was a lot of elderly, um, but our young were pretty safe. Um, 
in the summer 2020, our local K through 12 school district came out and sent a survey to all families asking whether we wanted our children to go back to school in person for fall of 2020. The results showed that 80% of the families in the school district wanted their kids to be back in school in person. Then we were told that wasn't happening. It was too dangerous for these kids to be back in school. We needed to protect them. They were told they couldn't have all those kids in the middle and high school and still be able to keep the six foot social distancing policy. If you don't mind, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt and I know this is, is difficult. So I have a couple questions of what you just said. Is one, 80% of parents, I wanna make sure I understand this, 80%, so more than, well more than half of the families wanted their kids back in school and they felt that it would be a safe environment. Is this correct? Correct. My other question to you is, you mentioned the social distancing, the six foot. Did they ever talk about why they, where they came up with that guidance or why they needed it to be six feet? I'm just curious. My understanding is it came from Fauci um, that was the number that he had and the NIH had stated was the appropriate number. Today, there is information and, that has come out that says that was a guess. That was not fact based on any factual or scientific data. However, that was the number that was used in order for the kids to go back to school safely. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, no, I just no. wanted to clarify. <laughs> That's fine. Representative Potenza. So based upon, just kind of following up on what um, uh, Representative Comtois asked, so when school guidance came out, it was just like, in a sense, n not giving any reasons. It was kind of like we're doing what we're told, like CDC guidance, that kind of thing. Like if people questioned it, was it, did they get a, just a kind of a canned response for people that did question when it? When we did question, when questions were asked, it went back to the CDC guidance was what they utilized to make their decisions. Um, there was at later times, they looked at um, com rate, community rate, hospitalization, um, then vaccination, like when could teachers be vaccinated? Um, all of that information, um, and I'll speak to it later, but they, the feeling from our perspective is that the bar kept moving and that created a, an entire environment of uncertainty and pressure on families, but more importantly on the kids and the students because they were told one thing when we met that it was changed. Um, and the bar would be moved out further. And so it became very difficult to have a good understanding of when they would be back in school and what that would look like. Quick follow-up. Go ahead, Representative. So, you know, before I was a representative, this was, I was in this uh, kind of uh, space, <laughs> kind of fighting against all this uh, stuff. And, um, and I received the guidance um, that came out. And I was just wondering, as a parent, because my girls were not in a public school at the time. And, um, but so for example, I got, I got the guidance from districts that were right next door to you, big districts like a Portsmouth and stuff that had, you know, it was kind of like, think of it all like on an Excel spreadsheet, but did you get that with the yeah. red and the green? And yes. uh, okay, so you that, had all they, they and but they kept you that, got that to at the beginning. No, oh, okay, that piece came out. And again, please forgive me in my recollection here, but that came out later, um, in the spring when they started saying, okay, so the first part of it was we don't have enough room for all of the students to come back to the school based on the six foot social distancing. So that was the first reason that they could not do it. Um, 
again, despite 80% of families saying this is what we wanted. Um, there was one local elementary school um, in Brentwood, Swayze, that did go back in person, and they found a way to make it work where kids that wanted to stay home were able to do a remote with their teachers, and the kids that wanted to be in person were able to be in person from day one, um, starting back in fall of 2020. That worked well. I don't know how, you know, it would be great if someone could track the impact of the kids that were in person versus remote. Yeah. On that. You, your district was one, I, I believe my recollection was one of the ones that was at either at the last or was forced by the governor to open, correct? We were forced by the governor. Thank you. Yep. And I will talk about that because that is one of the things that really impacted my daughter is this yo-yoing. Um, you know, again, these kids, after they were told the middle and the high school didn't have enough room for six foot distancing, I believe it was November, the guidance changed and they dropped it to three feet. At that point again, People were excited, thinking, okay, now perhaps we'll get back to school. Again, the high school and the middle school, they said it was too complicated to get those kids back in school the middle of the year. Um, may I ask who is making that decision? Was it the school administration or the school board? It was a combination, I believe. It was being presented to them by the administration but the school board seemed to go along with all of the recommendations that were coming down from the school administration. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so pretty much after my kids had this summer where they were doing competitive sports, they were interacting, they were living life, they were then told, you know, you were gonna be remote again. Um, you know, and at that point, you know, they, they ended up going back to school online in their bedrooms by themselves. It was my youngest, her senior year, and that's how it started. Um, so then I mentioned in November, there was, I believe it was November, the social distancing changed from six feet to three feet, but that still wasn't enough to get us back. Middle of the term, too difficult. Um, too hard to make that happen. Around that time, what we did not know until after the fact is that the school administration signed and, and the school board signed an MOU with the teachers union that prohibited the ability to do hybrid learning. Um, just for my clarification, could you please repeat, did you just say that over the request of parents and for the benefit of the students, the school administration and the school board went against 80% of the population and signed a memorandum of understanding with the teachers union that said that you could only go back if it was full time and not a full time um, some full-time and some remote. Is that correct? At the, at the end of the summer, there was a survey to parents, and 80% of the parents surveyed wanted their children back in school in person. Come November, December, and I would have to go back and look at the specific dates and the emails because I have them, um, they changed and started saying we could not go back in the middle of a term. They also started talking about the rate of COVID having increased again. So that perhaps the surveys that were done in the summer were no longer relevant because now there was a higher rate of COVID than there was at the beginning of the school year. They also, at that time, signed an MOU with the teachers union 
that stated that there would not be hybrid, they would not be required to teach a hybrid class, which meant all classes had to be either 100% in person or 100% remote. This becomes important when January comes along and we are told that our kids could go back to school in person if they would like. So my daughter, a senior, wants to go back to school in person. I then find out that unfortunately, and a lot of the seniors, if you are taking AP classes, if you are taking honors classes, if you are, um, if you are taking a high level language class, high level math class, anyone where there might not be multiple sessions of that classes you would still be remote. You could go into the school and you could Zoom from the band room, the cafeteria, the gymnasium, wherever you were assigned, but you were sitting in there with a number of other students that were all taking different classes and you would Zoom into your classroom while the teacher was in the classroom and you were not, the students were not. I just need to kind of wrap my head around this a little bit because um, it sounds very convoluted to me. However, so what you're saying is anybody in a high-level class who would have to go to the school and sit in an empty classroom with other kids in that school and the teacher would be remote? No. Not quite. If you were in a high level class, a class, and there might only be one session of that class offered, and there were students who opted for remote, and there were students who opted for in person, because of the MOU that was signed, they could not offer hybrid so that the student that wanted to be remote could dial into the classroom and the rest of the students could be in the room with the classroom, with the teacher. Because of that, the school solution to that was to assign the kids that were in person remote to a location within the school building. For instance, the band room. It might be the cafeteria. So they would be assigned to a location within the school building while the teacher would be sitting in the classroom by themselves. And the students would dial in through Zoom from whatever room they were in in the school while the teachers taught fully remotely. So let me just rephrase what you just said and see if I understand this. The teacher was actually in the building, but because of a memorandum of understanding with the teacher's union, e that those students could not be in the same classroom as the teacher because there were some students that were remote. Is that correct? Correct. And again, I'm the teacher, I guess since they were remote for that class, they could be teaching it from anywhere. I use that they might have been in the classroom because they... So could they could have been at the beach for all you know. I, I'm just <laughs> being facetious, yes, but from anywhere. Okay. Thank you. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to drill a little bit of that too, because I want to, I, I think I understand the issue and I want to draw a good distinction just to make sure. Um, because I, I can, I can just playing devil's advocate. I can imagine a scenario where because remote is a different thing than in person, maybe a teacher gets assigned to a room the size of a broom closet to be remote and there's no room for students, but I want to be clear, that's that's not what was happening. If they were in there, they were actually in a classroom where there were seats and they just didn't occupy them? I have to tell you that I can't tell you where the teachers were physically. Okay. I can tell you where the students were, um, that the students were remote. Well, I guess, I guess there's another way I could ask this, yeah. which is 
the 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 rationale for doing this had nothing to do with whether or not the students could be accommodated in a classroom that was equipped for Zoom, but rather solely because of a memorandum of understanding. That is my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. Any, okay. Um, so, again, forgive me, I'm trying to make sure I'm staying. Okay. Um, so as I said, the we felt like the bar kept moving. January, she put down that she wanted to go in person, and then we found out her classes would be remote. There were kids doing classes from their cars. There were kids doing classes from coffee shops. There were kids doing classes from home. There were kids driving between home and school because they had one remote and one in person. It, it was, there was a lot that went on at that time. Um, so for after the excitement of potentially going back to school, it was a letdown for my senior to find out that it wasn't going to be that way for her. So she decided to remain remote because she could not study and she couldn't zoom in and listen from a band room while there were other kids taking different classes around her. Um, so she ended up remaining remote at the high school until the governor told the schools they had to go back in person in April. Representative Potenza. Um, just a quick question about that. So in trying to understand, so they opened up the school, which even though it was fully remote, like you said, and she decided that she wasn't going to do that because it wasn't really going back. And um, so did they do all of the protocols? Like, so for, I know it was bare bones in a lot of these schools when they did open up, because I know a couple did this same thing yeah. that you're talking about. So was it bare bones staff there pretty much? Um, and then pe kids were assigned to certain rooms. You might not know so this. So I was going to say, I can't okay. answer that. What I can say though, is there were classes that did take place in person. So it wasn't a hundred percent remote when the school opened up. Okay. It was only those classes that they had students that wanted to be both remote and they had students that wanted to be in person and that they could not move them to another section of the class. Yeah, they couldn't do both. They, because they, like, so if you, and let me give you an example. If you were taking freshman English, there might be 20 or more freshman English classes. So if you have 80% that want to be in person and 20% that don't, they can find a way to move students around so that the 80% could be in person for that freshman English class and the 20% could be in a different class remote. However, when you talk about, you know, honors physics, Can't do that. you don't have that flexibility and that option to do that. And so that's why it tended to impact the upperclassmen, I believe, more yeah. than the, the lower grades. Were you familiar like when when you um, when you expressed that you wanted to go back and she was excited in January if th those were underneath all of the you know we're still gonna operate under three feet um, you're gonna be required to wear a mask all that all those protocols were still hardcore in place right yes and they had the hallways directional yes um, so yeah I've been to I, I was there in the high school uh, multiple times during yeah. that and so yeah that the signs were everywhere they were on the floors walls yeah. all of that exactly okay thank yep. you can you <clears throat> thank you can you tell me how they did an honors physics class remotely so great question um my daughter was having, by this point, she was starting to struggle in class. Um, one of the things that I had done when I heard that the school was not going to be open in the fall, I looked online and said, if she needs to take classes, why not have her take classes where she gets college credit? So she took two classes from Great Bay Community College. She took classes at the Seco School of Technology where she earned her LNA. And she took two classes 
at Exeter High School. Those two classes that she took at the Exeter High School were the stress. That those were the ones, there was no understanding of what was going on. There was confusion. There was, it, it was challenging. It was frustrating. It was, there were no set expectations. It, it was, those caused her anxiety and stress. And at one point I reached out to the school and I said, she will no longer be attending the classes because this is not. Um, and she took a break from attending the online classes and we figured out how for how she could get the information and learn on her own. Thank you. It, so no, you couldn't learn honors physics online. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, she went to those online classes. She obtained her LNA, as I mentioned, her senior year, which that was challenging because um, it was really hard to get clinicals. And but they managed to do it at the very end of her senior year, and she was actually able to pass the licensing exam in the spring of twenty one, right before graduation. Um, she, as I said, my daughter was a gymnast. Um, she had to wear a mask for high school gymnastics, yet she could go to club gymnastics and that was no mask. Um, imagine being a gymnast on the beam or on the bars and your mask slips. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was interesting. They started then getting to the point where you could hang your mask on the apparatus or hand it to your coach before you got on to did your event and then your coach would hand it back to you, which was very sanitary um, and made a lot of, so, so those were the things that she was dealing with. Um, it was, you know, we had friends that played tennis. They had to play tennis with masks on while their opponent was across the net. Um, so there just seemed to be this trying to understand, trying to help us make it make sense and feeling like we weren't getting, we weren't looking out for our kids. The decisions that were being made were not in the best interest of the kids, in my opinion. Um, we felt like COVID kept being held over their head and that the bar for when life could become normal for them, kept moving. Um, then they were told after the January attempt to go back to school in person for my daughter, some were able to, um, they were then told that school could go back to normal when teachers had had the opportunity to get vaccinated. And that once the teachers, all the teacher categories were vaccinated, one month after that, because that would allow them to get the two shots and or whatever the time frame was, I can't remember, then we could go back to school. That was the next thing. Then it became the handout with the spreadsheet that talked about hospitalizations and community rates of COVID. And based on those charts, then we could or couldn't go back to school. Um, we went through all of that. So then after we were told about the vaccinations and that the teachers, you know, as they got to be vaccinated, the conversation at school became, are you vaccinated? Teachers were asking, students were asking. It became a common question for everybody. Are you vaccinated? Are you getting vaccinated? When are you getting vaccinated? To the point where the school had to send a notice out stating that that was not an appropriate topic or question to be asked of students. So again, my daughter's feeling a lot of pressure about, I need to get vaccinated. So then they went from there and they told them that they could have their senior prom. And that was big news. That was exciting, happy. It was going to be held in the parking lot outside. Um, and they would have to wear masks. 
if they were unvaccinated, along with a list of other requirements. There would be social, a whole variety, a whole list of things. Uh, first, um, just a quick question for you. I thought you just said that something came down from the administration that asking students or anyone if they were vaccinated was inappropriate. Is that correct? Yes. So how could they ask students that weren't vaccinated to wear masks, and how would they know who wasn't vaccinated um, if asking that question it was inappropriate? That just seems to me duplicitous. That was a great question. And um, the students were asked to provide their vaccination card when they checked in for prom that evening. I just need to clarify something again, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being no. repetitive. The administration sent out a memo to school officials saying that asking if a student is vaccinated was inappropriate. Is that correct? In the school environment, correct. In the school environment. Was not the prom considered being in the school environment? The prom was not a right. It was an activity. It's it, not it, but, but it is still associated with the school, is it not? In my mind, yes. However, I was not the one making the decisions. Thank you. And who, may I ask, who made that decision? Was it the school administration or the school board? So I have an article that I brought with me on, oops, that's not it. Um, I have an article that I brought with me from the Seacoast Online that says EHS administration aware of plan to mark, oh, I haven't spoken about the marking of the vaccinated students yet, but I will. Um, EHS administration aware of plan to mark students at the prom, SAU 16 superintendent says. This was on July 28th, 2021. Okay, so just following up on this. So the administration was aware of it, but this, and the superintendent was also aware of it, but it doesn't say who's taking responsibility there. So I'm just... So let me let me back up one minute yeah um because please to fully understand what occurred and why i don't have those answers um so my daughter showed up to the prom we did she did not have a vaccination card because she was not vaccinated um when she showed up to the prom they had decided they would mark and number the hands of the students who were not vaccinated and they tracked that on a document that the parent volunteers, I believe, were responsible for. They then went into the prom and there were underclassmen who were recording after every three songs, the students would raise their hand up and they would record the numbers of the students with markings on their hand so that they could keep track of where you were and who you were with. So. Uh, Representative Potenza. Okay, so I wanna go back real quick to the guidance, okay? Cause I, I do know this pretty well and I'd like you just to confirm. So. So most of the guidance that was coming out, I know of in another district, and I believe it was in your district as well, guidance was given out directly to the students through their email addresses, sometimes even bypassing the parents in regards with these protocols, right? Pushing yes. with vaccines and clinics and all of these types of things that were happening. And then um, through them kind of in a sense getting slapped, is when then the administration sent out a blanket message to say, you know, oh, sorry, we screwed up, correct? That's how my it, understanding. Okay. And I know where that guidance came from, and I'm going to provide that to the committee. I have all of that information. Okay. But if you have all of those emails, that would be extremely helpful. Um, I have a bunch of emails from another district, and I think it would be very good because it's similar, but still different. Yeah. 
Um, you know, and then the other piece is um, in a lot of this came from peers feeling this stuff in, in of course, possibly even in teachers or administrators saying these things like off the cuff, up, which they never should. But in, in no time, anybody ever talked about um, medical privacy or any of these types of things. None of this stuff ever came up, right? Everybody was no wanting to know their status. Correct. And um, yeah, correct. You know, and that was one of the things that I, you know, wanted to specify here was that when she went to the prom, she was excited to go. She was unvaccinated and the guidance had been that she would have to wear a mask. So she had actually had her grandmother who trimmed her, who hemmed her dress making matching mask out of the bottom of her prom dress, because that's, that's healthy. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, so she had a matching mask created from the bottom of her dress that she could wear since she was unvaccinated. Um, what had happened though, is right before the prom, the mask mandate was dropped, which is why they made this decision to mark to number them. And that decision, I never received any notification that that was happening. We went to the, um, like the promenade where the students all walk by all the parents and we cheer for them and everything. And I noticed that there was um, this black staining on my daughter. And I said, what's that from? And she goes, oh, wait till you hear. And she told me that was how I found out that they were planning on doing this. So that was just one more kind of blow to her of, you know, she was being marked based on her medical decisions. Represent Potenza. Okay. So when that, it's very interesting because I remember the timing and dates wise. So at the same time that guidance came out, which slapped all of the schools about this specifically, you know, creating two classes of students and all of that kind of stuff. The most important thing that was sent to every single superintendent, um, every single superintendent, every single school board in the entire state, and all of that information should have came down, like where you heard the guidance. This is from the, from the Department of Education, which, you know, it came specifically from their lawyer. Um, so you didn't get that directly. You only got a second hand. Oh, we can't do that anymore. Correct? Yes. The, the other thing that had happened was because there was such a thing made about vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It almost became, as you said, that second class, um, you couldn't get invited to things if you weren't vaccinated. Some parents wanted proof of vaccination to go to prom parties. Um, so it just, it kind of rolled and it became bigger and bigger once the students start feeling like, oh, well, everyone's telling us you should get vaccinated. You're not, that's not safe. I don't know if you can come. So it almost sounds like a form of discrimination. It, would you say that uh, based on what you're telling me, um, that people were actually discriminating against people that were not vaccinated. Is that correct? Against students that aren't vaccinated. I felt that my daughter was treated differently. Um, I felt that it's a form of pressure, bullying, harass, you know, that's what I felt was happening. There was this pressure that you need to do this. You need to do this. Um, and it was pretty clear what the message was, get vaccinated or be left behind. And, and, and did you, and do you feel that that message was um, more from her peers or from just the public in general? I think that message was from everywhere, even, even today, you know, two days ago, I walked into Walgreens and I took a whole bunch of photos because everywhere you look, 
get your vaccination, free vaccination, have a vaccination. All of this information about every vaccine under the, and not one place does it specify what the potential risks are. It's beautiful marketing. It's beautiful information for people to get it. Hey, it's free. A lot of you can get it for free. Um, but there's nothing on those marketing materials that tell you, here's the potential side effects. Here's the things you might want to think about before you get this. Representative Potenza. Do you recall, and you might still have emails, of how many clinics they had? Okay, second question. Do you feel as if the, I'm just gonna have to use the word insanity because it is, um, that was created by all of this, is, is, has got to be a top down. All of these teens, they're impressionable, all of this type of stuff. This, it just can't oh, come absolutely. out of nowhere, right? So, you know, pounding and pounding and pounding and losing school and losing friends and losing this. Uh, right. So, I mean, it, it has to come from there. Like, you know, it, it has, it did become every, everyone, but didn't it start, it had to start from the top. Absolutely. The message was clear and consistent that the world could open up when everybody got vaccinated. And if it didn't open up, blame the ones that refused to get the vaccine. And that message was loud and clear. Um, yeah. Uh, any other? So all of that, I mean, that kind of builds up to the pressure that she was feeling, the stress she was feeling. I didn't even talk or mention just the whole process to apply for colleges, visiting colleges. That was a whole other experience that we could spend a lot of time on. But the real blow for her came when she found out that in order to go to the college of her choice, that she needed to be vaccinated. May I ask what state that college was in? It so she looked at a variety of colleges. The one that she chose was in Maine. Um, Thank you. And so some of the colleges had programs where they would um, tag your college ID. And so that wherever you swiped it, whatever door, whatever, whether you went to the cafeteria, it was clear and you were supposed to be masked while unvaccinated could not. So they had different different universities had different approaches that they took and that was all over the country um that wasn't just here um she chose maine because it was a very strong healthcare college small it fit what she wanted it wasn't that far from home um so we kept thinking that if she if we waited and kept waiting people would realize the data wasn't supporting this. You know, there were breakthrough cases happening everywhere. So we kept being very optimistic that eventually they would say, yeah, it's okay. Um, which was very naive on my part. Um, the end of July, my daughter went to a freshman camp up at the school and they didn't require the vaccine for her to go to that freshman camp. She lived in the dorm, she had a great time, stayed up late, hanging, made friends, did all sorts of things, loved it. Um, but they still were requiring the mandate to actually go to school in the fall. Um, I tried to get a medical exemption, but at that time, those were extremely hard to come by. And we kept asking if we could get one and none of her doctors, nobody felt that she had any reason not to get it. If anything, they felt because of her chronic pain condition that she should get it. I represent Potenza. So I, I, my family experienced that too with a, a daughter of mine. So um, do you feel as if kind of everything that we knew, previous history, all of these types of things, you know, um, went out the window 
um, even, even of course, kids that had, you know, disabilities and stuff that, that went out the window and we, Absolutely. because we couldn't find any doctor anywhere. Absolutely. It, and you, to even bring it up, you were, um, I felt like you were treated differently if you even brought it up. Um, they, so, so she ended up getting it. We couldn't get the medical exemption. Um, my gut kept telling me not to let her get it. Um, I didn't think there was enough research. I didn't think there was data. There wasn't, um, I was just afraid of how she would react to it. Um, so we waited until the last possible day, August 4th, 2021, two weeks before she had to go to school. We went up, we got the vaccine that morning and stopped, picked up lunch and went to the beach to eat. And she said she was tired. She wasn't feeling great. She was tired. And could we just go home? So we did. Um, we went home and she went upstairs to lay down. And about 30 minutes later, she came back downstairs and told me she wasn't feeling well. She said something's not right. Um, she felt like her heart was racing. She was sweaty and hot. And we checked her heart rate and it was over 180. Um, she was an athlete. Um, so I called the doctor's office and I was told to take her directly to the ER. Um, there, the waiting room was full. Um, it was, um, there were people who had been waiting for hours. Um, but they took my daughter straight back. Um, they did an EKG. The EKG came back abnormal. Um, and she started feeling really sick, like she was going to throw up. She was very nauseous. Um, so they gave her medication to try to slow her heart rate. And after they would give her the medication, her heart rate would drop for a few seconds and then it would elevate right back up. So they kept trying to figure out what was happening. And eventually they told us that she was going to be admitted to the ICU. Um, she didn't feel good, you know, at I don't mean to interrupt you. And no. I am so sorry okay. that as a mom that you had to deal with this issue. Mm, uh, two questions are one, um, where was she vaccinated at? Yeah. What vaccination did she get? And I guess I do have a third question. When you went to the ER, did the doctors there ask you if she was vaccinated and when she received it? So your first question, because I was concerned, we actually made an appointment um, at Hutchins Memorial Hospital in Wolfboro because I wanted her not to be in a mall or on a, you know, yeah. So that was where I wanted her in a hospital setting because I was, I was concerned. Um, the second thing, she got the Johnson and Johnson because we felt it was one and done, you know, get it. She was done. Go to school. Third question. Forgive me. What was your, when she was admitted to the ER, did they ask if she was vaccinated? And then the second part of that was, is did they ask when she was vaccinated? So we told them, I don't think I gave them the opportunity to ask that question. I told them as soon as we got there, that this was a vac, that she had just gotten the vaccine and that this was happening with the vaccine. Um, two things is, they kept testing her for COVID over and over for her entire hospital stay, and it kept coming back negative. Um, but they, that was one thing that was very interesting. Um, they ran a lot of blood work, and they ran a lot of different tests, and the diagnosis, the immediate diagnosis, was severe tachycardia um, from induced from the vaccine. Um, my daughter 
she turned to me and she just said, Mommy, I wish I didn't get the vaccine. Am I going to be okay? And I just kept telling her, yes, <laughs> it's going to be okay, you know? So after they told me she was going to the ICU, they told me because she had just turned 18, I couldn't go up with her. And so I ended up finally convincing them to allow me to go up and make sure she was settled. And this is the middle of the night now. So I convinced them to let me go up and set, get her settled in. And I did. And the plan was for her to have a CT scan in the morning. Um, they felt like she was comfortable and, you know, that she would be fine. We got up to her room in the ICU. Um, and we weren't even in the door of her room and the phone was ringing. And it was the ER doctor saying they'd gotten test results back and that she needed to go immediately to CT for a scan at that right then. Um, so that they could do a chest scan and see what was going on. They felt something was wrong based on the blood work that they'd gotten back. Um, they told me I couldn't be there. My daughter asked me if I would stay at the hotel next to the hospital. Um, and I, so at that point I left, um, when they brought her down to the CT and I went in the parking lot and I sat in my car and I cried. Um, that was, I was trying so hard the whole time we were there just to be mom and strong. And so got out to the car and I cried and I'll tell you, you know, it's been really hard to forgive myself for letting her get that vaccine. Um, that I didn't fight hard enough and listen to my gut to prevent her from ha feeling that she had no other choice. But the more I look back at this, um, the more that I look back at this, I'm upset with the system that brought this on that gave her no choice. Um, she spent three days in ICU and then she spent one more in just a regular bed and her heart rate would spike every time she moved. So her resting heart rate over the next few days slowly went down to 140, 130. Um, I think they wanted it at 120 as a resting heart rate before they would let her go home. Um, she had one of her friends came to visit and the mom called me afterwards and said, Tara, she, cause she's hooked up to all the monitors and everything. And she said, my daughter said, anytime Abby moved all her, like just adjusting in bed, her heart rate would spike. Just a simple thing. Sit up in your chair, heart rate would spike, machines go off. And so it took, you know, that was what she was dealing with. Um, so when we brought her home, she was dizzy, exhausted, nauseous, and she kept saying her heart hurt. She kept saying her chest, her heart, it hurt. But there was nothing wrong, no answers, tachycardia. Um, at one point, I believe we were told that it was like she'd run a marathon for days and that she was healthy and fit, which is what allowed her to run that marathon for days. Um, and so that might be why it hurt. Um, so we got home and my husband, um, let me back up for a minute here and catch my thoughts. Um, I think I mentioned that I'm a little bit upset with the system that created this environment. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is I felt they harassed her and they bullied her um, in so many different ways into getting an experimental unproven vaccine in order to be able to live her life. For 18 months, COVID was held over her head as to why she couldn't do anything. Then the COVID vaccine was held over her head if she wanted to have the future that she wanted. 
went from COVID being held, can't do anything because of COVID, to now you can't do anything because you're not vaccinated. Um, at this point, we had the knowledge, the data, that COVID wasn't impacting our youth severely. Um, we had the information. We knew many, many vaccinated inv individuals who were getting COVID with breakthrough infections. Um, when we came home from the hospital, my husband would carry her up and down the stairs. Um, so every night we'd carry her up, every morning we'd bring her down. Um, we got a stool for the shower so that she could take showers. Um, so we did everything we could to make her comfortable and let her lead her life. Um, she lost 20 pounds. Um, she's 5'2", and she weighed 110 pounds. Uh, so she dropped down to 90 pounds. She couldn't eat. She felt horrible. And despite all of that, she somehow managed to go to school that first semester. Um, we didn't want to take that away from her. My husband and I went round and round on whether or not we let her go to school. We talked to the school. We got accommodations. Um, she would get hot flashes. And so they let us put an air conditioner in her room. Um, we simplified her schedule so it was the bare basic, um, bare minimum so that she could try to have that college experience. Um, they ended up moving her to a single room, uh, just because she needed to rest so often. Um, and it was just, she's 18 and this is how her college experience started. Um, that first semester was filled with doctor's appointments. We would drive back and forth, my husband and I, to pick her up and bring her down and then bring her back. Um, just do whatever we could so that she could be at college, have that, but still tr get the treatment that she needed. And she, she wanted the social. She wanted to be there. Um, she tells me now that she doesn't remember very much about her freshman semester which doesn't surprise me <laughs> at all. Um, I will never forget one call that I got from her and a friend of hers. Uh, her heart hurt really bad. And her friend said, she looks green. She doesn't look good. Something's not right. Um, she was dizzy, nauseous, and they didn't know what to do. And she told me she thought she was having a heart attack. So we went to the ER, um, they did an EKG, said everything looked normal and sent us home. Um, really nobody knew what was happening. And my perception and my feeling was that when they heard this was a vaccine injury, I felt like people didn't want to be involved with it. Um, so we had no answers, we had, no, it was, this is, she'll get better, or we don't know. We don't have any answers for you. Um, so that was her freshman year. Um, we, she decided, and we decided she would not go back to school in the spring. Um, she kept, we kept her home to try and heal, and we did get some answers. Um, in addition to tachycardia, she has POTS. Um, and gastroparesis. So her POTS, uh, which is pastoral orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, that's being treated by a neurologist with a medication that she takes three times a day. Um, and that has helped her with some of the dizziness and some of those symptoms and her heart rate fluctuation. Uh, her gastroparesis is being treated by a gastroneurologist with medication that she takes daily. That medication costs 600 plus a month. Um, and a few weeks ago, her insurance declined it. Um, after two years of being on it, it was declined. And so we went back and forth. We finally got to the point where she said, 
I was getting texts from her and calls from her and she find, she's like, mom, I'm nauseous. My stomach hurts. I can't eat. I've lost weight again. So I said, I'm going to pick the medication up right now. It doesn't matter what it costs. You need it. Thankfully, the insurance approved it that day. Um, so that was two days ago. And so she is starting to feel a little bit better now fortunately. Um, so unfortunately it showed us that she's still dealing with these health issues. They haven't gone away. Um, does she need to be on these medications the rest of her life? I don't know. Um, I hope not. I hope we can find a way to get her off from them. I hope we can find a way to help figure out what's causing the pain in her chest. Um, She'll still have that, and nobody knows what causes that. Um, we've just been to so many doctors' appointments, therapy. We've gone to uh, different types of doctors as well um, because a lot of the treatments aren't covered by insurance. If you want to have um, acupuncture or if you want to have IVs um, to try to help rebalance the body, um, getting some of the blood work done is not something that most doctors will order. So we've gone to different um, individuals to try to get additional answers um, that we haven't been able to get through traditional doctors and that we all, we pay for out of pocket. Um, she has been through so much and yet she continues to always have a smile and a positive attitude. Um, Currently, she's in the process of finishing up her junior year in college and looking at graduate programs to continue on to the medical field. Um, she still wants to go to the medical field and help people. Um, she has a medical exemption for all vaccines going forward, and she also has a permanent handicap placard um, as well. We were told that not having a vaccine may impact her ability to get clinicals and graduate and graduate from school. Interesting thing right now, unfortunately, even though medical professionals no longer are required to get the vaccine, COVID vaccine, and even though schools, many colleges no longer mandate the COVID vaccine, there is a group of people that are still being pressured and required to get that. And that is our college students who want to go into the medical professional. And what they hold over their head is the inability to get clinicals or rotations. And you need to provide your vaccination status in order to get those rotations and those clinicals. So forgive me for my ignorance here, um, but if she's already been vaccinated with the J&J, &J, which was a one and done, why would she be denied clinicals because she is vaccinated? So the J&J, &J, she is vaccinated on. What she is not now, because she has a medical waiver for all, she is not vaccinated for the flu. Um, she is also had to do a titer test for hepatitis B, I believe it was. And even though she had, when she was very young, three, I believe it was three doses of the hep B, I believe it's hep B um, vaccine, her titer test came back that she had zero particles of that vaccine. So she is completely unprotected and therefore she also needs to get the hep B vaccine. So she, yes, she is considered vaccinated for COVID now. There are other medical students who are not. Um, I had an opportunity to meet a couple of wonderful gentlemen who are in a nursing program and they went down, I 
can't, I think they went to Liberty College because it was the only place that they knew they could get clinicals. So even today, this is still being, um, I don't know how to phrase this, but it's still impacting students who want to go into the medical fields because they have to provide their vaccination statuses and it may not allow them to get the clinicals and the rotations that they need. Represent Potenza. Going back to when she first was in the hospital, can you do you mind saying where she first was with her, um, like where she, like where she went when she stayed when she was in ICU? Wh wh where those were? She was in Exeter Hospital. She, did she ever go any other place outside of Exeter? Not, not for that hospital stay. No. Okay. Um, for subsequent, um, any other. She has gone to the ER in Portsmouth. She has gone to Boston Children's. Children's. That's what I was saying. She has gone to Mass General. Okay. She has gone to, she had a team of four neurologists. One was a, um, the autonomic dysfunction neurologist. One was the gastro neurologist. One was a movement specialist because her chronic pain has gone into severe pain, a severe flare from all of this. Um, she's not been able to walk. Um, so she sees a movement disorder specialist and she sees a pain management specialist as well. Are those all out, out of Massachusetts? No, she goes to Dover which is okay. affiliated with Mass General. Yeah, Mass General. So it's a Wentworth bit of a Douglas. mix. It's okay. a bit of a mix right. of where she goes. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, as a mom, looking back, is there anything that you feel that the state should have done differently anything going forward that we should be looking at um and any suggestions for anything in the future that may come down the pike um just want to see what your ideas are or your opinions um yeah. if you don't mind no that's um yeah um i mean in terms of what the state could have di been done differently at the beginning, there was this fear of the death rate was supposedly so high on this, um, on COVID, when it first came out. And that, that scared everybody. But I think once that information and the data started coming out and it was available, I think there was a concerted lack of effort to share that. Um, one thing I'd like to say also is, and I, I haven't even talked about the censoring that went on. Um, I brought a post that my daughter made because two months after she was, after her vaccine injury, she wanted to share because nobody understood why she was so physically depleted up there. And she wanted them to know this isn't me, <laughs> you know, this, and all she kept hearing was vaccine, 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 that was still being pushed everywhere. So she made a post and I'm going to read exactly what she wrote. Um, this is not a post I would typically make, but I feel compelled to share my story. I am not anti-vaccine, but I do believe in medical freedom as people know their body best. I got the COVID vaccine in early August, and that night I was admitted to the ICU. Two months later, I'm still dealing with side effects. Everyone, including medical professionals, 
disregarded my concerns due to my underlying conditions, which was that pain condition that she had. They all told me to get the shot and they wouldn't give me a medical waiver. After my reaction, everyone says I should have gotten a medical waiver, but by then it was too late. It makes me sad to see the level of anger and pressure towards people who are remaining unvaccinated when no one except them knows their particular situation. Please have compassion and understanding that people are doing the best they can with the information that is out there. She made this post on October 21st of 2021. And I, she included a picture of herself in the hospital bed. What you might probably can't see from where you're sitting is that post was tagged by Instagram. COVID-19 vaccines go through many tests for safety and effectiveness and are then monitored closely. Source, World Health Organization. She was not able to share her story without it being tagged. Facebook support groups that I was part of for vaccine injured would get shut down. Their posts removed, comments tagged. There was a degree of information that we were not even allowed to share what happened to her with anybody. And I, the interesting thing is I went back last night, the tag is now removed. So it's no longer important for them to share that information now, but it was when my daughter posted about that vaccine. And the reason I share that is because I think in my heart, I feel like that is important to understand what she was going through. It represents just a small piece of what she had to deal with when she spoke to people about her vaccine injury. And I'll tell you, I had, I had a close friend of ours. So immediately after it, we focused on her health, but then it didn't take us long to realize that people really didn't want to hear about her vaccine injury because that was the that made people uncomfortable because everything they heard up to that point safe and effective it's all safe and effective so one close friend of ours actually suggested to me a couple of days after abby got home from the hospital that i should feel better now that she was vaccinated and could prevent people other people from getting covid I had another woman tell me vaccine injuries are rare and that a certain rate of severe injuries was okay in her mind for the better of the rest of the population. So this is what we, would, we were going through on top of trying to heal. I also wrote letters to, um, I wrote, I've got two more topics that I really want to talk about. One is the letters that I wrote to our senators. And the other one is about our VAERS experience. Um, so I wrote letters because I felt like we weren't hearing anything. So I sent those emails and a staffer from either Maggie Hassan or Jean Shaheen's office, I cannot remember which office it was, called me quite some time after I'd sent the letter to them. And they called me because they wanted to ensure me that the Senator was working diligently to ensure everyone was vaccinated in a timely manner. They had a canned speech prepared for me that had nothing to do with my email or what happened to my daughter. The only commonality was that it was vaccine related. So I explained my purpose for reaching out to them and they said they couldn't answer my questions and offered to have someone else call me. I then got a senior staffer who reached out who then explained to me how rare these injuries were. They were sorry for my daughter um, and that unfortunately my daughter was just a casualty 
for the greater good of the population. I then asked, if these vaccine reactions were so rare, why had no one reached out to us from the CDC, from Johnson & Johnson, from the government, from anybody? Why had no one wanted to learn what might have triggered this reaction in my daughter that was so rare? Why did no one want to learn that? The other thing was, or was it that they just didn't care? Representative Potenza. Um, first question is in, in regards with, um, I know what you're talking about with the form letter multiple times. I can't tell you how many people tell us the same thing. It's like, it's not even read and it's just an instant response, which is, it's like adding gasoline to a fire. <laughs> I get it. Um, locally, um, I've heard from many constituents, um, that there was never a response from our governor that, that was on every, so you didn't hear back from that office at all? No. Correct. Okay. No. Uh, I guess the question is, is you reached out to the U.S. senators, but no one in the state government? I, I did. I, I blanketed a lot of emails, um, but the only person I heard back from was that one senator's office. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here. I'm sure this has not been easy. Um, now, I, I certainly wouldn't presume to estimate what the mechanism of injury your daughter may have experienced was, but given the, the sort of the uh, the rapidity or the acute onset of, of some of the issues, I would ask, because this is something we, we uh, heard about before lunch, um, I would ask if you were aware that guidelines for how vaccines were to be administered was changed um, in the lead up to COVID-19 such that previously, um, and I was a healthcare provider for quite a long time, so previously we were taught when administering an intramuscular vaccine, you insert the syringe or the needle into the, into the deltoid muscle group, and you pull back a little on the plunger to see if you're, you, if you get blood, you would indicate you're in a blood vessel and you cannot inject. Um, before lunch, we heard from a, a gentleman, an almost unbelievable story about the CDC changing their guidelines away from aspiration solely for the cause of it might be more painful if you aspirate. So I actually went on and I pulled this this pink uh, book that he told us about, and I'd like to just read briefly from it because I couldn't believe it myself. Aspiration is not recommended before administering a vaccine. Aspiration prior to injecting and injecting medication slowly are practices that have not been evaluated scientifically. Aspiration was originally recommended for theoretical safety reasons, and injecting medication slowly was thought to decrease pain from sudden distension of muscle tissue. Aspiration can increase pain because of the combined effects of a longer needle dwelling time in the tissues and shearing action, wiggling, of the needle. It, it is exactly what was described before launch, that for some reason, despite not citing any medical evidence, uh, that it was safe to make this change. It was simply less painful. In theory, they would no longer aspirate to see if they were in a blood vessel before injecting. Is that something you were aware of? I was not aware that they had changed the policies. However, my sister is an RN, and we had had conversations about the method of injections um, after all of this, and she was had told me about aspiration and um, how she used to always deliver injections, yes, but I was not aware. Thank you. Because the official that. recommendation for the method to deliver the COVID-19 vaccines was to deliver them rapidly and without aspiration with, as far as I can tell, no scientific backing for possibly injecting these into an artery or a vein. 
Do you Thank have you. a date on which that policy changed by any chance? Uh, I, I'll look at this to see if I can find a date on it. This is the pink sheet PDF I'm looking at from okay. the CDC website. Um, but I, I don't know the date, but I'll look for it. Okay. Thank you. Representative Potenza. So I had a question. I know you're going to talk about it um, in regards with theirs. So um, as you, I'm sure, are a bit well aware, the, it, the percentage is, is extremely high. Like I, I, I don't even know at this point, 90% probably, that they're not doctors, nurses, medical. They're just not trained in even knowing how to report. It's very cumbersome, all of that kind of stuff. So when you knew, because you knew right away that this was a vaccine injury, did you ask um, – did you ask the doctor? Was this at the ER? Did you who did you ask, and how did that process work when you said this needed to be reported to VAERS? So when all of this happened, I wasn't thinking about anything but my daughter. It wasn't until after she was home and later on um, that I some someone I mentioned said, "Have you made sure this is reported?" They then told me that I wanted to make sure that it was reported by the physician and not self-reported due to the weight that it carried when a physician reported it versus self-reporting. So I called the hospital to see if it was reported and it took 10 different phone calls um, before I got to somebody. Um, many of the people that I spoke with didn't even know what VAERS was. Um, they had no idea who was responsible for entering it into the VAERS system. I finally got put in touch with the director of infectious diseases at Exeter Hospital. And after looking into it, he agreed to enter it himself. Um, he was not her physician. He had never met her. However, he agreed to enter it in since nobody, they had no idea who should do it. Um, so he actually entered the data in and he sent me the VAERS ID number. So when I then looked up the VAERS ID number to make sure the information was accurate and entered correctly, um, you all can imagine how I felt when the number that was given to me pulled up a woman in her late 20s who had experienced a reaction, a reaction to the flu vaccine years ago rather than my daughter. So I reached back out to the director and I explained what I was seeing and I asked, confirmed, did you send me the right number because something isn't aligning here? And he goes, yeah, he goes, I entered it myself. I got the number and he pulled it up for himself. And he goes, Tara, I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing. And he goes, I don't know what happened. Um, I entered the data myself. This isn't right. At this point, I'll be honest, I gave up. Um, I, I threw my hands up in the air because what can you do? How far can you push this? Um, so that's when I started writing to all of our elected officials um, because I'm like, <laughs> you know, what, what, where can I take this? The hospital, I'm at the director of the, and nobody, like nobody seems to care. Represent Potenza. I don't know if you realize. I mean, I'm not sure you do how huge that is. Like that is the that is humongous. So if if you have on, on record, um, and if you can get on record the date that was entered, you know, um, the director of infectious disease and yeah. everything that he put in and he states through like a sworn affidavit of this. And then what is, what is presented? This is humongous. So I texted back and forth with him. We were on a text basis and I, um, unfortunately my, my phone dropped to the bottom of the lake, Oh my God. but i also had emails and I will look and see if I can find those specific things. But his response back to me, Tara, I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing. I actually re reached out um, last year, last, last fall, earlier this year. I can't remember, but yeah, I spoke okay. with um, Representative Eric Turr 
he is the Brentwood representative and he has spent substantial amount of time looking into this and he's talked to, I don't know, director of New Hampshire Health and Human Services. And he said he was, he, so he was doing research and looking into what happened um, as well. So you, it might be worthwhile to follow up yeah, with. We'll definitely could be could you up, yeah. repeat which representative that was? It was Eric Tur T-U-R-E-R, -E -R, from Brentwood, New Hampshire. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll look into him. Um, yeah. Also, um, would you mind leaving the information that you have so we can put it in our files that you brought um, yes. for our records? And if you could locate any emails regarding the VAERS data, yep. that would be extremely helpful um, for this committee. I mean, I can't even imagine as a mom what you're still going through. Um, I'm sure it's a living nightmare every day. Um, and out of curiosity, has your daughter been able to connect with any other injured, vaccine injured people so, um, for support? So I'd have to follow back up with her on that. Um, she has a close friend who was um, injured by the HPV vaccine. Um, but I don't know as she's got someone that she's directly connecting with over the COVID. There have been support groups. <clears throat> One thing I would say is it, when I was on a lot of those support groups, some of them got shut down. And, and may I ask, were those like on Facebook? Facebook. They were on Facebook and they were, were shut yeah, down. Yeah. So going back to your question earlier about, you know, future and what we can do that's why i brought up you know the blocks that we ran into and why we felt nobody cared and our voice couldn't be heard um people we know other individuals who were injured by the covid vaccine a lot of them don't want to speak out um may i ask why, why do you feel that they don't want to speak out I, I guess, I mean, are they embarrassed? Are they confused? Um, do they feel uh, they'll be uh, stigmatized? I mean, I can't speak for recently, but I can speak for when this first happened. We lost friends. Um, over my daughter getting injured by the vaccine, y you know, it was a taboo subject people didn't want to hear it because it made it <clears throat> real. I don't, I can't tell you why. I think some of it was fear. I think some of it was, you know, it got to a point where you, like just us trying to share information, you would get tagged. Um, misinformation or guidance. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you on it. All I know is I, I can't not speak up. And as my daughter says, she doesn't want to have what happened to her ever happen to anybody else. Um, well, yeah. I, I can't tell you how appreciative I am and, um, that you've come before here, and I'm sure that it's taken a lot uh, to come and talk about this. Um, Representative Potenza, and then Representative, I mean, Representative Polizvitz, and then Representative Belcher. Go ahead, Yuri, you. Oh, it's not working. Hit another one, maybe. Uh oh. Okay. I'm sorry for what you experienced and that the state failed to deliver accurate information, but uh, thank you for sharing it with us and fighting for your daughter and for other daughters. And 
as a huge injury happened in 2021. And in 2023, um, state epidemiologist uh, Dr. Benjamin Chan uh, testified uh, in state house uh, uh, that COVID vaccines are safe, but he did recognize that there's some increase uh, in my myocarditis, but mostly in boys and my young males. And uh, uh, if it's the personal, you, you don't have to answer. But my understanding is, uh, y your daughter is not was not born uh, as a boy. So, do you know, like, uh, if uh, if other women were, uh, if there are other women who were injured by by this uh, uh, COVID vaccine? Uh, Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, after what happened to my daughter, I was talking to the mother of one of her classmates from her elementary school, Swayze. Um, so Swayze is not a huge school, but there was a, another girl who went to school with Abby and had to get the vaccine for college. Same thing. And she ended up being rushed to the hospital afterwards with very similar, um, the rapid heart rate, not feeling well, um, the same day that she had gotten her vaccine. We also know of another individual who lost the feeling in her legs after the vaccine. Um, and I don't know the status of that person now. We also know um, someone else whose diabetes went out of control after. So there were numerous, and it seems now everywhere we go, people are now ready to share a little bit more about their experience and what happened to them after it. Um, but back in 2021, it was not a subject that we discussed. Represent Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again. Um, so I, I can I can speak to the veracity of many of the things you've said because I too have experienced them. I was fairly significantly injured um, after an mRNA vaccine. I uh, too had the distinct impression sometimes that when some healthcare providers would learn that I was a vaccine injury patient their attitude would shift significantly. Yeah. I too experienced uh, censorship when I attempted to tell about what had happened to me. Uh, my social media accounts were suspended. I was not able to access them. Um, now I'm a little, little bit older. Uh, it irritated me to no end being censored, but it didn't devastate me to lose my social media accounts at the time. Now, younger people are much more tied in on social media. I can only imagine that that experience for them to lose access to their friends and their primary means of communication, I expect in many cases, would be much more traumatic than it was for me. So I guess my question for you is, do you think that the censorship that did exist around this, losing access to social media because she simply tried to tell her friends in the world what had happened, what her experience was. Um, do you believe that that contributed to a sort of environment of, um, of, trying, to, of trying to prevent people from talking or, or keeping people from ta speaking out about, about their situation? Yeah. So I guess, first of all, um, I'll be clear. My daughter never lost access to her social media, um, but she was hesitant on what to post. And when she finally did post, they tagged it. Um, she, I think that definitely made her hesitant to share anymore. Um, I know as an adult with it, it made me hesitant to want to share information. Um, and I know a lot of other people were hesitant to share or speak out because of 
the perception. There was a narrative. In my opinion, in my personal opinion, there were certain things you were allowed to say and you were not allowed to say. Talking about vaccine injuries and harm from vaccines was not allowed. Representative Elizabeth. Uh, it's not a question, more a comment to committee. I agree that we need to look uh, what happens uh, with uh, virus database, but I heard from reputable sources that they have double numeration, so there's like not a single number, but there are two sets of number, and when a report is uh, submitted, people receive one number, but then when uh, database is queried, it's, it's different set of numbers, so they don't match, and uh, there were some other cases when it was causing a confusion, so not saying it should be this way, but there might be some explanation to it uh, besides like uh, uh, just something we need to consider. Thank you, Representative. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, Again, I just want to say thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add or that yeah. you would want to say to this committee or? I think the last two things kind of, and I appreciate you having me tell, talk through what happened with our family. Um, I think the other things that I'd like to share is from my husband um, this morning the one thing he wanted me to make sure everybody heard was before our daughter received the vaccine, everybody cared about her vaccine status. After she got her vaccine and was injured, nobody cared about her vaccine injury. And that, you know, you couldn't go to restaurants museums. People wanted vaccine ID cards. Maybe not here in the state of New Hampshire. Some did. Some did. Um, nobody cared. Um, so the second thing is just going back to what the state should look into. Never let these schools, schools close down. These kids should never have been removed from school and not allowed to have that education and that social interaction. We harmed our children so much more. Um, and it never should have lasted as long as it did. Um, the VAERS system, it, it's not, it doesn't work. Uh, Representative pulls off, then Representative Potenza. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my other question. And if it's too personal, don't answer. But like we are often told that, as 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 you were explained, that it's for the better good, and some small cases happen. And we are told that uh, there is a special fund created by government that compensate in cases of vaccine injury. I'm here that it's almost impossible to get that compensation and it expires uh, quite quickly in a couple years. So did you ever try? Did you ever get anything? Uh, well, first there was a lot of misinformation um, provided in terms of what you could and couldn't do, at least to me. The second thing was by the time there was one policy that was not COVID vaccines were not eligible for. And then the other one that you could be eligible for expired, I believe it was one year after the date of vaccination, but it was a minimum amount. And because my student was a college age student, she didn't have loss, or I mean a high school student, she didn't have loss of income and her health insurance covered bills. So she didn't have anything to go ask for from that and then it expired within a year so by the time we learned about it even to look into it she wasn't eligible anymore 
Um, but no, there's there nobody's been held accountable or helped um, from that standpoint. Yeah, thank you. Representative Potenza. So I'm, I'm trying to find the article and my computer's about to die, so I'm not going to be able to. Um, so there was just a, it was recent. It's got to be in maybe the last week or two. Um, I'm not sure if it's a, if it's a pharmaceutical company. I think it might be, it could be Pfizer possibly, or if it was the CDC, but so in addition to VAERS, I'm sure you're familiar with, there were, there's, was a couple different avenues, right? So manufacturers were taking in um, uh, injuries, uh, reports, uh, CDC was taking in a piece of those as well. And then of course the cumbersome VAERS system, and which is very easy, um, hard for people to like get data from and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. So it, they just released uh, one pharmaceutical company just were forced to, compelled by the government, to release the level of like calls and all of that kind of stuff for injuries. Are you familiar with that? I'm not. Okay. So I'd love to, I'm going to find that information and, and get that to you. Um, I would love to have our committee follow up with any pieces to have your story and um, and to see whatever we can do within our power to make sure um, that there's that there's things that are held accountable, um, especially timelines with the school. And, and that's extremely important to me. Um, yeah. I, I can't even imagine the level of medical bills and all of that other kind of stuff that have, uh, that have surmounted in this, in this whole thing. But I'd also love to help you with a whole community of, of folks as well. Cause I, I really think that they're, the voices are there. Some people are scared, um, but it needs to come out. But the community's big. We're kind of our own family. So <laughs> my daughter's vaccine injured. So there's listening to you, them. I just I just want to cry. I yeah. was crying pretty much half the time. So there's there's a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of, but it just there needs to be a bigger voice, an official voice, and we need to look at everything and make sure we don't run into this COVID experience again. It needs to be handled better. Um, uh, and that is the mission of this committee is to see what we got right, what we got wrong um, going forward. And again, I cannot tell you how much we really appreciate hearing from you and you having the courage to come and tell your story. Thank uh, you. So thank you so much. Thank and you. if you could, uh, if you find those emails, yes, um, would greatly appreciate uh, that. If I you will could. look for the school emails, and I'll look for the documentation and the screenshot I took of the VARES. Okay, that would be That's awesome. Well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, for the rest of us, is there anything that we need to discuss at the moment? Uh, currently, it looks like our next meeting will probably be April 26th. I'm hoping to hear from Director Buxton. I'm not sure yet. Um, uh, don't have any speakers lined up at the moment. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just a question, because we, we talked this morning first. We opened up with some possibility, some brainstorming for some questions to DHS. Do we, shall we just simply forward whatever we have to you? Uh, yes, please. And if you have any uh, questions that you want to direct to uh, Homeland Security also, um, to forward those also to me. Um, because in looking at the email that um, Representative Ebel read this morning, you know, she talked about how they also handled part of the financial portions, uh, some of the federal monies regarding the rollout. Um, so it looks like they had a pretty big hand in things. Um, so yes, if anyone has any questions, if you could forward them to me, I will forward them on to the appropriate agencies. Uh, Representative Ebel did ask uh, for a for me to email the questions that I sent off to uh, Patricia Tilly. Uh, I will forward that email. Uh, I will f forward those questions to everyone so that you can see the questions that I sent to her. I also let her know that all those questions may not be under her purview. And if they were not, uh, if she could direct us to the appropriate person. Um, 
So is there anything else that uh, we need to discuss or that any needs anything that needs to be read into the record at this time? Seeing nothing, I will close the meeting and uh, we'll probably meet on April 26th and I will try and make it at 10 a.m. <laughs> Everyone enjoy.